Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda today and that is that our CPSC staff will brief the Commission on the fiscal year 2017 operating plan. The CPSC staff members briefing us are Mr. Jay Hoffman, our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Patricia Atkins, our Executive Director, and Mr. Dwayne Ray, our Deputy Executive Director for Safety Operations. At the conclusion of staff's briefing, we will turn to questions from the commissioners and those will last 10 minutes each, but we'll begin now please with the staff briefing. Mr. Hoffman, are you going first or Ms. Atkins? Ms. Atkins, if you can please begin, thank you. Certainly. Um, good, good morning and thank you, um, Chairman Kay, and good morning to the commissioners. Um, in terms of the, the slides that you have in, in front of you, there are brief slides um, and at the conclusion, certainly we will be prepared to answer, um, to answer questions. As far as the FY um, 2017 operating plan process, um, there was a broad range of inputs uh, considered in formulating the plan, including suggestions from our stakeholders, certainly the public, um, as well as individual uh, commissioners. I think if you recall back in June when we had the priorities hearing, uh, that certainly gave us uh, a list of things to consider with respect to our stakeholders and the public. Uh, Congress has not uh, enacted the FY 2017 appropriations uh, or a continuing resolution at this time and the FY 17 operating plan is premised on the 130.5 million dollar budget that we submitted in February 2016. Uh, there are 6.5 million dollars of new initiatives that we have added to uh, the FY 17 president's budget. Those items will be deferred um, upon final uh, until uh, we have final appropriations enactment. Um, agency funding allowances will be certainly calibrated to the enacted short term CR. We expect that this is going to be approximately $125 million, um, which is our current funding level. Uh, as is certainly our process, uh, we expect that in the spring 2017 mid year, uh, we will use that opportunity to align um, and amend uh, the operating plan. Uh, to make it consistent with the full year appropriation. The new strategic plan alignment, um, CPSC's operating plan is the key implementation plan for the agency's strategic plan. Um, the staff has identified priority uh, activities um, to accomplish uh, as a result of the strategic plan and I think that you notice that we added an appendix uh, to the operating plan that highlights um, the new strategic activities. Uh, just to do a summary of the strategic goals and then some of the significant priorities that had appeared in the FY17 um, President's budget request. Um, the strategic plan, four goals that we have certainly shared with you um, going through the strategic plan process. The first uh, is uh, workforce in terms of cultivating uh, the most effective consumer product safety workforce that we have here at C CPSC. Uh, strategic goal two is prevention, uh, prevent hazardous products from reaching consumers. The third goal, response, respond quickly to address hazardous consumer products both in the marketplace as well as in cons with consumers. And the last strategic uh, goal, communication, uh, communicate useful information quickly and effectively to better inform decisions. Uh, on the right hand side are the prior priorities as I mentioned that came from the uh, February 2016 submission. Those four items, uh, improving U.S. effectiveness at ports of entry in identifying and interdicting products that do not meet U.S. laws. The second one, identifying emerging technology and consumer issues related to nanotechnology as well as chronic hazards. The third, warning about product hazards, um, empowering our stakeholders and the public through effective communication. We also would be responsible for implementing congressional requirements uh, in a prudent and timely manner. Uh, this goes through the contents of the uh, operating plan, um, the areas which certainly we have shared with you in earlier pre-briefings, uh, the summary of changes from the 2016 enacted to where we are proposing the FY 2017 operating plan. Then that's followed by uh, the funding and FTE by organization and then we go into the key performance measures um, that are externally reported and describe the progress of the new strategic plan objectives. We also have the proposed voluntary standards and then the proposed mandatory activities. 
After the first section, there is a more detailed section in the plan, um, and these are the areas that are covered uh, within each of the ma major mission organizations. Certainly the resource sum summary that identifies the funding and the FTEs. There's the overview and key priorities by organization. Then we have the strategic plan alignment, and then we have performance and operating plan measures, and then the annual milestones. This is the last slide, um, and it's the summary of changes between our FY 16 and what we're proposing for 2017. And on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll see where we're starting from with the $125 million. Uh, and then these are the activities that um, are planned for, uh, but certainly these will be deferred um, pending when we get our enacted appropriation. Um, so the key changes here, uh, first there is a reduction of $1 million um, for the third-party testing burden reduction to assure compliance because of what was enacted in 2016, and we have sufficient funds to cover that in 2017. Uh, the next item has to do with um, our uh, safety incident data gathering, and we're setting aside uh, $500,000 for that act, uh, activity. The next one, import uh, expansion. Uh, this is the $3 million in terms of increasing port presence uh, for our surveillance pilot program. And then the last item um, has to do with our research and exposure to potential chronic hazards uh, related to nanomaterials uh, in consumer products and then crumb rubber uh, related to playgrounds. Uh, so as indicated, those items in the middle would be deferred until we have our final appropriation. Um, that concludes my presentation. I would like to say uh, thank you to the staff uh, that prepared the um, FY17 operating plan. Um, certainly that is Jay Hoffman and his staff, also James Baker, uh, all of our program area staff that con contributed um, to that. So we are prepared to answer all of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. And I'm going to we'll begin the round of questions now. And thank you, Mr. Stevenson, for the laborious job of keeping track of all of this. I'm going to begin where you left off and begin start by thanking the staff. This is obviously a very heavy lift every year. A significant amount of work goes into it. It requires offices to gather a lot of data early in the process, months from prior to now. And to run that up the chain and for OEX, the Office of Executive Director, working with the Office of Financial Management to really try to turn this into what we have now. And we're deeply appreciative. And Mr. Baker, thank you for your work as well. You're not at the table, probably happily so. But as our Chief Budget Officer, obviously you are at the nexus of this. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn, and I'm sure we'll have multiple rounds, and so the this topics, I'm sure many of these topics will get covered in multiple different vantage points, but I want to start with uh, trying to frame some of the visibility into some of the work and why things move and don't move. So I guess I'll start with Ms. Atkins, but maybe Dr. Borlase, who's sitting behind Mr. Ray, might end up joining us. Uh, can you give us some visibility into the unplanned uh, work that comes up during the fiscal year. Last year, for instance, we had a number of major compliance actions that staff so successfully completed on behalf of the American consumer, but those have a resource implication. Uh, can you explain how that works in, how you try to manage to that, and then also what the practical aspects of those things are, please? Certainly, and I'll invite my colleagues to the, you know, certainly to the right and left, um, as well as George to share. Uh, we had some very major activities last year, and I think you all are aware of the hoverboard activities, certainly uh, lumber liquidators. Um, there were other activities um, that, because of the overlap, um, be it with compliance or uh, certainly in EXHR, um, it involves staff um, moving away from their existing um, packages um, to bring forward to the commission and focusing on on those. Um, uh, I, I usually refer to the bench in, in terms we have we have a very sort of short uh, bench in terms of people being able to fill in when we have other activities that draw them away from um, the packages, the programs that we're working on to bring up to the to the commission. So it does have a resource in implication, has a timing uh, implication, and, and I think you'll see um, by way of the um, different mandatory standards um, that were carried over 
uh, for FY17, there are a considerable number of them, and they are in varying stages, um, but nonetheless, we still were not able to bring them forward to the, to the Commission or to complete um, some of the other either data analysis or the technical act activities. So um, that's what um, affects uh, the timing of bringing things forward. Thank you, and I would just ask, and maybe Dr. Borles has this information, have you been able to um, quantify what that means in terms of real effects on staff time to have those types of uh, compliance actions like we had last year? Yes, uh, using an analysis of the timesheets for the staff where they've had to put the time the last year versus where we had planned in the FY16 operating plan, EXHR specifically has put about five additional staff years of time towards compliance support above what we had planned already in the uh, 16 operating plan. And just to contextualize that, is that a significant or an insignificant number for EXHR staff? Well, it's uh, five staff years that's significant in that it has to come from somewhere, and that's five staff years then of project work that we were deferring as we reprioritized that time towards the compliance activities. Thank you for that. That's, that's very helpful. And in terms of trying to get a little bit more visibility into some of the projects, and I'm going to start with petitions, for instance, because obviously people petition us for a reason. They're looking for a specific action. Whether it's warranted or not, we have to do that analysis, but they certainly have an expectation. Can we get a little bit more visibility into some of the petitions and where they stand? I think there are at least three. There's probably a lot more, but there are at least three that come to mind. There's the organohalogen petition, there's a residential elevator petition, and there is a supplemental mattress petition. And I didn't see anything, and that's okay. I, I don't think we need every little bit of detail, but do you have a sense as to, since they're not on a table as showing that they will reach some specific regulatory milestone, do you have a sense as to what the expectation should be of the Commission for this kind of work and what the limitations are? If we're not able to cover it as much as we would, would it, is that resources? Is that because of scientific information that hasn't yet been learned? Can you help us with that, please? So for the ones you mentioned especially, then um, the next step for staff is to bring to the Commission the briefing package that recommends whether the Commission approve defer, deny, or take some other action on those petitions. So just a reminder of where we are in the process, because sometimes that can get a little confusing where we are. In terms of work on it, um, so we had time in 16 operating plans. Some of that got deferred. Staff has been working on those packages. So for each of those listed in as a briefing package to the Commission in 17, we do plan to bring to the Commission that briefing package for those to uh, recommend grant defer deny or other action and we do have the time planned in this 17 operating plan in our kind of internal planning process we've put the time towards those uh, projects so that we can complete them and bring them to the Commission in 17 great thank you for that and the reason I mentioned petitions is really because of they are similar in my mind to the compliance actions where they are somewhat unplanned and I know in the oper operating plan you carve out space for it but ultimately, you can't anticipate with any type of accuracy how many we're going to get and what the magnitude are. And not every petition is the same. I would imagine that organohalogens requires a different level of work than something else would, for instance. So thank you for that. Uh, while you're still up there, if we can switch to the epidemiology side, can we talk a little bit about the work that's mentioned in the operating plan about predictive modeling and how the epi team envisions that helping us, what are we not able to do now, and how would the predictive modeling enable us to do our work better? Thank you. Sure. Um, let me just, I have some notes because it all runs together, as you can imagine. Barbara lines. Thank you. So on the predictive modeling, um, what we're trying to do, and we've been working on this in EPI starting last year on this, is really tie together kind of and create a feedback loop from the injury reports that we get in say through saferproducts.gov through actions that the uh, staff take especially compliance related actions that then get captured by dynamic case management so the idea is if we can link injury reports coming in with actions that we've taken as we get future injury reports in we can have a better idea of um, instead of 
doing an independent analysis every time, say, well, we've seen this pattern before, we know how we've adjudicated before, and like I said, create that feedback loop then between the two systems. And how quickly would you anticipate we would be able to see some type of yield from this effort? Um, for 17, staff's um, going to be implementing the software that we need and then creating the model and uh, testing its ability to predict. So perhaps by the end of 17, we'll have some raw results, but from staff's plan, it's not necessarily envisioned that um, we've got full results in 17. It also takes some time. We've been using the integrated teams to populate the fields to get the information, but it takes some time to develop enough of a baseline, if you will, so that you can have enough results from injury report reports coming in that you can use it with some accuracy. Great. And for those who might not be familiar with, obviously, clearly, commission is, but anyone viewing, can you explain just briefly what our integrated teams are, how that works? Oh, sure. So uh, for the integrated teams, we have interdisciplinary teams involving different offices, both within EXHR, but also with the Office of Compliance. And these are the teams that look at every incident report that we get in. So as an integrated team, this inter interdisciplinary team of subject matter experts actually reads and, uh, and uh, reviews every incident report, the injury report that we get into the commission. Great. Thank you. Obviously, data is central to all that. And on the topic of data, I'm going to switch to Mr. Ray for a moment. Uh, can you give us a sense? We I think during the last operating plan, based on an amendment by Commissioner Burkle, we talked about having industry be able to upload monthly progress reports for corrective action plans. Can we get a sense as to where that is, please, and then what it would take to be able to push that out to the public like we have our letters of advice? Sure. So um, at this point, we have put together the statement of work and are in the process of um, getting the contract piece together on that. Um, assuming that flows, then they'll go through into business requirements, uh, make sure they fully understand what we need to happen, and, uh, and then they'll start specking out uh, the system and ultimately build that piece. Um, so that's the piece on allowing companies to submit the reports currently. Um, we do not currently have plans for the outward public publication of that. Um, assuming uh, we were headed down that direction, um, you know, I think we, we need to work through some of the policy issues related with that. But beyond that, uh, from a technology perspective, um, we would, you know, do a similar process, um, develop a statement of work, um, also spec out the requirements, and then integrate it into the existing system for publication. Great, my time expiring. Thank you for that. There's obviously legal issues associated with it, not only the policy issues, but it's something I'd like to continue to explore. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I want to join in the uh, thanks to the staff for doing an excellent document. Uh, over the years, I've noticed these have gotten more and more readable, um, and this one probably is as readable as anyone I've seen, so congratulations to everyone who's put in all the work to do that. Uh, I also can't help but note that our funding level <laughs> is within the margin of error for most other departments, and it's just amazing uh, what this agency achieves with such incredibly modest funding. Uh, and so, again, that's a credit to the staff for, for being uh, so diligent. So the first point I want to make uh, is if you were to look on page 9, you'll see that a project called Table Saws has slipped <laughs> from this fiscal year to next fiscal year. Um, and I don't think it surprises anybody to hear that that makes me extraordinarily sad and disappointed. And so I actually had a what I thought was a five-minute eloquent discourse on why this is so important, but my staff this morning assured me that it was a 10-minute snarky rant. So <laughs> I'm not going to say anything further other, other than to uh, make the most urgent plea I can to uh, Ms. Adkins and the staff that they work as diligently as possible to move this project along. Uh, and you don't ha even have to respond to that. That's just a, uh, a plea from me. But I also, uh, picking uh, on page 10, 
I see that we have uh, resources uh, and as a priority a moving a voluntary standards training program. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see this. Uh, I'd first like a brief description, if I might. I think this is one of the most critical uh, activities we're undertake this year. So could somebody just give me a brief synopsis of what's going to be in this voluntary standards training program? Good morning. So uh, Patricia Edwards, our voluntary standard coordinator, is still putting the training together, but uh, and she's come along on it. And what we're envisioning is training for the staff so that um, they develop the skills to be able to be as effective as they can be in the voluntary standards participation. We recognize that just being hired at CPSC is probably not enough on its own to have you uh, to have the skills to work on the voluntary standards, so we're looking at putting that together. And I can't think of anybody, anybody better situated to do that because Patty's been involved in negotiations for years, uh, and by all accounts, when you talk to the folks at ASTM and you talk to the folks uh, in the industries where she's been doing the negotiating, she's extremely respected, liked, and effective in making points that are so critical. This is a terrific way to have a multiplier, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to see that we're doing that, and I applaud you for having uh, Patty Edwards do that. And I also can't avoid saying how thrilled I am to see Patty Edwards in this job. She hit the ground running, and she is a whirlwind of activity. Uh, I think she's identified some serious issues with respect to the voluntary standards process generally. I think we now, at least I now appreciate that as good as it's become, uh, there's still substantial reforms that I think need to be done with respect to the groups that are writing voluntary standards. And I'm so glad that Patty is immersed uh, in that at this point. Uh, and I just wanted to alert uh, the chairman that um, I'm thinking through a possible uh, proposal for the decisional that would uh, free up some greater resources for Patty to do the job that she's, uh, she's doing. And I know you're very, very sympathetic to this, and a lot of it depends on what available resources we have. Um, so uh, just a couple of uh, questions. My, my normal question, uh, which is on page four, and it has to do with fast track, and it says that 90 percent of fast track cases will have corrective action initiated within 20 business days. So two questions. First of all, what does the term initiated mean? And secondly, within 20 days of what? Is that within 20 days of the initial report? Uh, and what starts the clock running on that? Uh, Commissioner, I do not have that exact answer for you right now, but I will be happy to get back okay, to you. Okay, I appreciate it. I will it. note it's not a new measure. I know. It's um, not a new question. I've yeah, asked which all the base, baselines, uh, okay. but I am not prepared to give you that okay. specific well, I, answer. Thank you. I, I, I certainly appreciate that. And, um, and then just a, a small question, but it's one I've been meaning to ask, and I, I apologize for not having asked it during the uh, weekly briefings, but uh, when I'm looking through the list of voluntary standards, I keep running across flammable refrigerants. And that, that has been a big issue, uh, but I, I, I don't have a sense of where we are and what we're doing with respect to flammable refrigerants. Can somebody give me a 30-second update on? Sure. So uh, staff from Engineering Sciences is working with the voluntary standards on looking at how the standards could be updated to allow what are called colloquially called flammable refrigerants. They're viewed as a green alternative to some of the refrigerants in use now, R134A, et cetera. So that's uh, staff's focus is working with the voluntary standard on updates to allow these, you know, what they would call like green refrigerants. Okay, yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm just very interested in that because I was at the commission when we were petitioned, and I don't know why I'm blanking on the chemical that was used if, as refrigerants, but it had all of these devastating effects on the environment, and so now that that's been removed, we've moved back to uh, these other refrigerants that seem to work well. They just have this problem of being flammable, which the others didn't. So uh, that, and because we know their refrigerants are used so widely, it, it's an important issue to stay on top of. 
Um, on page 12, um, I notice we have this project 112A2 mortality incident data. Incident data. Um, and for years, I know we have had serious problems getting other agencies which are collecting this data to share the data with us. And uh, I've blanked on the reasons for that. There was either a statutory reason why they couldn't share it or they wanted to charge us a whole lot of money. But uh, have we gotten on top of getting, uh, I think it's National Center for Health Statistics, but whether whatever agencies are collecting these data, are we now satisfied and comfortable that we're getting the data as quickly as we can get it? Um, I'll have to dig into what were the specific problems okay. before. Um, in terms of what's captured in 11282, we do have a robust medical examiners and coroner yeah, no, that reporting we've, we've program. Had for years, yeah. Right, so, but I'll have to get back to you on the specifics okay. of what were the holdups with some yeah, of the Yeah, I appreciate that. And by the way, I want to apologize. Uh, this year, unlike most years, I haven't had a chance to send the questions to staff that I planned on asking. So uh, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot. I, I don't like doing pop quizzes. Um, the other uh, sort of a broader question I've noticed, and that is uh, this year, and if you look at pages 17 and 18 and 23 and 24 and other pages throughout, there are a lot of things that are listed as metrics that have the word baseline. And uh, I think I know why that is, and I think it is a reflection of the strategic plan, but I'm wondering if somebody could explain to me uh, why so many of these have the, the word baseline and do we have a general sense of uh, is this a, any time we see the word baseline, next year we won't see the word baseline? Bob, I'm going to have um, Jay Hoffman answer the question, but I asked the same question as well because I was comparing um, the <coughs> various milestones and, and certainly the, what was in, intended to be accomplished. Um, it, so, uh, it, and they seemed very similar mm -hmm. to what we may have already done in, uh, in the past. So Jay Hoffman can share some more information about it. Sure. So baseline is actually a term that comes from the OMB circular A11. So it's a process that a lot of agencies use. Mm -hmm. The reason we use the word is typically when we have a new measure that the data sources and definitions have not been sort of sufficiently put together or defined. And so it's basically a one-year period to sort of get things together, make sure the calculations work before actually committing to a target. In some of the baseline measures that appear in these pages, and I spent quite a bit of time going through each of them, it would appear that we have some of the historical data. And so I've asked my staff to, between now and, you know, probably budget time come this spring, to say, hey, can we start calculating some of these prior to the one-year mark? But if not, the short answer to your question is yes, next year these would be populated with a number. Yeah, and it's not a criticism. I think that's a d source of constant revision is, uh, and the constant upgrading is, is generally a good thing. I see my time has expired. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. This is my fourth op plan, and every year I appreciate um, even more how important this document is and how much effort goes into it. And I not only thank the four of you, but all of staff who put in so many hours of effort. Um, in putting together this operational plan. And I also just want to thank all of you, and then there are others also who have answered questions of ours and given us briefings. And I just really appreciate the effort in, in helping us understand this plan. Um, as you all know, last year I did not share the laudatory comments of a couple of my fellow commissioners on the transparency of the op plan, and I was quite critical of the timing because I think we were past half half the fiscal year when we got the app plan. There wasn't any participation by commissioners, and uh, the, t the, I, the plan itself was very, very opaque. This is a very different year, and I really want to thank all of you, and I want to compliment you on what we got this year. We're getting to it before the end of the fiscal year 2016. I was very appreciative, as I know um, at least some of my fellow commissioners with whom I've spoken about this um, uh, are, is are with respect to the participation that we had in terms of giving ideas. Obviously, it didn't mean our ideas necessarily got incorporated, but I understand that. But at least it was participatory. And I just thought it was uh, just so professionally done this year. And also the plan is much more transparent in terms of the description of the project so that we can understand it so much more. So I really wanted to thank you for that preliminarily. 
Um, I'm still, as you know, waiting a couple, uh, well, some pieces of information. We're getting a breakdown of the hours and the, and the contract dollars that are being expended on the line items, as I understand it. And also there are some specific questions that I think each of you have that you're going to be getting back to me on before we, we vote on the, on the final op plan. I also just wanted to note that um, and particularly thank Ms. Atkins for the effort on the strategic plan. Um, I really, really appreciate how much you're trying to make this into a living document, to use your words. Um, and by aligning the op plan with the strategic plan goals, and even as Commissioner Adler was just talking about with these baselines that we're trying to get some new metrics, um, I just really appreciate the enormous effort that's gone into that by all of staff, but obviously you've been, you've been the person coordinating that, and I want to thank you. Um, the deferment of, of the, of the 6.5 million, I just wanted to add a couple notes um, uh, just to flesh that out a little bit. As I understand it, on the 3 million, uh, Ms. Atkins, that is deferred um, pending approval of the final budget that we're hoping will be over the 130 number. The Healthy Children at Home Play in School, a million of that, as I understand it, is for the Chrome Rubber Project and 2 million is for the nanotechnology project. Is that right? I'm not sure if that's for Ms. Mr. Hoffman or Ms. Atkins. Um, it'll probably go over to, um, to George, if, depending on what specifics you want for each, each of those I areas. Just wanted but to, but that, I just wanted the breakdown that that's, that's correct. what they were. The okay. numbers are correct. And then the $3 million um, for the, what to increase the port presence would be 15 new staff members with respect to monitoring our ports. Is that correct? That's correct as well. And then the last thing that I understand is, been, is deferred and pending um, the approval by Congress is the $500,000 for escalated uh, NICE contract costs and improving functionality of NICE. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Do you want to add to that? There's, there's one aspect of it. So it, the, the only wrinkle in that is that the contract escalations have already been agreed to. And so we'll be working with the XHR to make sure those are funded. It's not huge dollars. Most of the money was okay. for the technology. Okay, good. Because I, I just want to note how strongly I feel, for anybody from Congress who might be listening, <laughs> how strongly I feel that each of these items is so important to consumer safety and for us to be able to do our missions. Um, I have some specific questions of my own, but I just wanted to follow up um, on a couple of them that um, Chairman Kay asked. Um, Dr. Borlase, with respect to the predictive modeling, am I understanding this correctly that once this is in place, what we're hoping is if there's a particular type of hazard that we'll be able to, compliance will be able to quickly look at what we've done in the past um, for purposes of defining our course. Right. It'll be the entire integrated team. So it I'm won't sorry, be. Integrated it, team. Right. For the integrated right. team. So all of the different offices could see that relationship. Okay. And so when we do this, we're. It doesn't necessarily, we'll do what we did in the past, we'll just know what we've done. Is that right? I, I mean, I just, I, I, rem I remember one recall recently that when we went back um, with that particular hazard, we'd handled it very differently in a number of, of recalls, and um, then we decided that we would do it better this time. So I'm just hoping that that analysis would go into it. If I could jump in a little bit. Um, sure. the, the the idea is really to help us improve uh, the ability to identify things that we should investigate and start working on. Okay. So it's not so much like what did we do as far as a compliance action, the specifics of a case, but, you know, if you think about the volume of, of reports coming in, if we have to put eyes on every one, is there a way to have a system help us focus our eyes to the most important ones? This one may be like one that we did something with, meaning we recalled, and try to focus our energies on that and, and using a system to do that versus, you know, like we say, in a whole team of folks looking at every report every week. Right. Uh, so that's the vision of the, uh, the predictive modeling piece. Um, we've been working on it for some time, uh, and so we're hopeful that we can get to that point through this process. Thank you for that explanation, and that's, that's terrific. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to quickly follow up on is these, these electronic monthly reports, which I think you have all five commissioners agree this is, this is a great idea. But in your explanation, Mr. Ray, of, um, uh, of what we're hoping to do this year, I'm wondering if as part of this in terms of the description of the work 
I know there's a more technical word to, phrase that you just used. Um, but are we giving some thought to, because I know what's in it for the companies reporting to us, but I, I wonder if we're able to do this electronically, if, they're, if we're putting real analysis into what the CPSC can gain in terms of being able to more carefully monitor what companies are doing um, with respect to the recalls that we're coordinating with them. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're hopeful that by getting the information in a, in a system in a more timely manner, then, um, you know, that we'll be able to react more quickly um, to the data that we're, we're receiving right now. I mean, that's a challenge because, um, like you said, it's a manual process um, and it doesn't get updated as quickly as if companies are able to put it right into the system. So we're hoping those efficiencies will help us react. Um, to the data as we're as we're getting it. Okay, I would just strongly encourage you that not just uh, not just to focus on the speed, but the quality of the information we're getting because some of the some of the information, some of the reports that I've looked at, and when we examine it with with um, you in particular, we've looked at some of them. Um, at the quality of the information is such that we have to dig behind it as opposed to having it right in front of us. So I just I just would encourage that. Um, um, Dr. Borlase, I, I asked you a question in our, in our private meeting on this, but I just wanted to follow up on this description on page 7. Um, it's number 76 on the child safety locks. Um, could you just um, tell us what, what, that, what is anticipated um, in terms of of what, what is included in the safety locks and other household child and accessibility devices? Sure. So uh, the staff's proposing adding a voluntary standard activity number 76 on page 7 related to the safety locks. And from staff's uh, work on product safety assessments, et cetera, 16 identified that there uh, could be performance requirements developed or improved related to these are the small child proofing locks if you will that they're known as where you could put a plastic lock over the toilet so that a child can't lift the toilet usually used under the sinks to as cabinet locks so that the cabinets can't be easily opened so staff's proposing actively working with the voluntary standards to develop and improve uh, the performance requirements for those so that they don't break easily and that they um, are strong enough from a physical sense that they don't break when used and could you tell us why we're adding that at this point? Yes, so uh, we're staff's proposing adding it at this point uh, from information we learned when we did product to safety assessments in 16 during the course of normal work with the Office of Compliance. We had reports in, uh, we, brought, we bought samples or had samples brought in as our engineering sciences staff was looking at the locks. We identified some what we felt were gaps in the voluntary standard. And so that feeds into our recommendation here in the 17 op plan. And are you aware of any voluntary standards um, presently that cover the use of biometrics or RFID technology? It's only recently come to my attention how ubiquitous those are, even in books. Right. Uh, following up on our conversation, uh, staff did do an initial look. Um, we didn't have honestly much time before today's hearing so they're still looking to get more specifics but we did identify some standards just at a first initial glance from uh, IEEE and a couple other standards development organizations. I'm out of time so. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you Mr. Chair and I want to echo my colleagues uh, appreciation for the ops plan and for your willingness to meet with us and talk with us and um, as I've said to many, this is really the beginning of a process until we have our decision on October 19th uh, for input into the ops plan and um, concerns and or suggestions. So, but again, thank you for your willingness and your cooperation in answering some of the questions ahead of time. Um, I do want to follow up on just a couple of things that were already talked about. And again, it has to do uh, with this increase in the budget. The um, or in the ops plan, the 6.5 million. So I just want to clarify, will these changes only be incorporated in the operating plan if the number of our budget is 130 million? Or, I mean, is that going to be how it's deferred if otherwise it won't be entered in? 
That, that's correct. We don't have the okay. funding. And so what if we get something between 125 and 130? How will we decide how to do implement it? Yeah, that's a fair question. We'll have to look at that and bring back a prioritized recommendation through the executive director. Um, and then on page two, the FTE breakdown for the various offices, um, it's already been mentioned, but I just want to clarify the 15 FTEs. So it's for import surveillance, but 10 will go to import surveillance, three will go to EXHR, and two will go to compliance? That's correct. Okay. But they will all support the import surveillance. Their role, with that, whether it's in EXHR or compliance, is to support the port presence? That's correct. Um, a qu and I don't see Mr. Wolfson at the table, but um, this, this is actually for him. George will be happy to move. Um, on page two, the Office of Communications will have an operating budget of $1.65 million and I'm, um, that will be allocated to each of the ma major educational campaigns. Can you break that down for us as to how they will be spent, whether it's Anchor It or Pull Safely? Yeah, I, I wish I could, but it is a bit situational. So for Anchor It, it has its own standalone budget. For Pull Safely, its own budget. So it really is based upon the ideas of the staff or the needs at the time. So there's some discretion at this point. Um, so I would say a million dollars is allocated for pool safely? No, that's a standalone allocation of one million beyond the 1.65. Okay, so that's, so that's pool line, safely gets funded through that. Itself. Okay, so Correct. that doesn't come from the 1.65? No, it does not. Okay, and then anchor it has to do with what we've agreed to in, in ops plans right. in mid-year, right. right? Okay, and then any of the other, like, back to sleep, what, what else is included in that 1.65? Sure, it's, it's the 24 activities that we have and it's really, you know, where staff feels like there's new priorities for the office, new opportunities to partner with other organizations, uh, new media opportunities. So we, it's, it's a bit organic. We allow the staff to share their ideas coming up uh, to us, but we, we just allow the flexibility to have opportunities present themselves while utilizing our resources to the best we can. But it speaks to the value that we have through the Anchor It campaign, through the Pool Safely campaign, to have that full-scale public relations activity. We just don't have that luxury with the other activities. We have to be a little bit more opportunistic through the development of videos, uh, production of posters, and then the partnerships or the collaborations that we have with our other organizations. Thank you very much. Mr. Um, Burkle, I'd just like to add one thing to that yes. in terms of Anchor It um, related to the how long a Anchor It is funded and I think uh, certainly Scott can confirm it's funded through September of, of next year. Of next year. Uh, let me 17? Just, 17. Right. Okay. Yeah. If I can provide one clarification sure. to that, um, we are not working with enough dollars to get us through September of 2017. Uh, the contract was just signed yesterday for the anchor a contract with Widmire to extend into the next FY, but it is only at $288,000. That will not get us through the entire fiscal year, but that can be a further discussion if the commission wishes. And I will defer to my colleagues to carry that water. Um, <laughs> at the mid-year um, FY16, ATV work was changed from an NPR to a DATR. Um, now, the table on page 9 has a target for FY17 back to the NPR, but I note that now specifically we're mentioning cons cons terrible word, conspicuity. Um, so are we now segmenting ATV work? Why are we just singling out conspicuity? Scott was on a roll. I was hoping it would continue. Um, for ATVs on page 9, the uh, proposed work is the same as what we had originally in the 16 op plan, specifically on conspicuity. Um, when it was deferred last year, it was for the voluntary standard. And the reason it's NPR this year, it is the same scope of work of what we had last year. We're looking at um, should the uh, voluntary standard process finish where they incorporate conspicuity, we believe we would need to do a rulemaking activity to update how the uh, ATVs are already captured in the CFR. And then should the voluntary standard not be updated to capture conspicuity, then staff would be bringing forward an NPR package specifically on conspicuity separately. 
but the standards committee addresses that issue, then we don't have to do rulemaking. Well, we would, uh, we believe we would need to just, it would not be to, um, it would be to update the CFR because under when they did the consumer and uh, honestly, that's, uh, I don't follow all the exact how I got incorporated, but because there are ATV requirements incorporated into the CFR, we would have to update those. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Adler brought this up and I just want to talk about a little bit more of this um, voluntary standards training program. Can you expound on that a little bit? Um, and also, um, it was mentioned by Commissioner Adler that there are some problems with voluntary standards. And I'm not sure if you have that information or if I would need to talk to Patty Edwards, but I would like to hear more about the training, who will participate, will it, what will the substance be, uh, and whether or not policy will be discussed during that training. The scope of the training as we're putting it together is really envisioned to be training that develops and sharpens the skill of staff in participating in voluntary standards. Uh, we recognize that it's an essential part of their job and it's an essential part of their performance. So just like any other skill that they would need as a professional here at CPSC, we're just fo uh, specifically focusing on that skill of participating and being engaged in voluntary standards. So, Like what skills? Um, I think skills associated with being able to uh, clearly communicate a position, clearly describe the foundation for recommendations, um, those sorts of skills. Uh, on page six, we've added to the uh, voluntary standards column, swimming pools, spa safety, vacuum relief. Is this a new voluntary standards committee or, are we just, or is it just because we're joining it now and going to participate in it? Um, that's, uh, you're referring to like number 23? Yes. On the, yes, so there's uh, two different uh, voluntary standard activities and we are recommending adding this one because we believe that there will be new activity on the safety vacuum relief systems that occurs this year. That's why we're recommending adding it. Um, on page 20, one of, and this is actually for Dwayne, I would guess, one of the compliance's priority activities is to conduct research on the submission of incident data from third-party platforms and e-commerce websites. Can you further explain this? What does that mean? Sure, this is, um, this is a follow-on of some work that we did over the last year with uh, Virginia Tech. And um, I, what I'll say, it's very much in the early stages. Um, we had some interns for the summer, so we were um, happy to have them part of this process. But what we realized through that is there's a lot of potential um, to use publicly available information. If you think uh, comments and, and, and things like that that you see on online sites, and somehow using that through a computer system similar to um, to what we're looking for um, with George's team and the integrated teams to try to help identify through this vast amount of information out there where there may be potential problems. It's very much in the early stages. Um, we've got some ideas on how that will, uh, will play out, but um, it, it is something that we're very interested in uh, continuing to investigate and research. So for instance, we would maybe peruse the Amazon websites and look at people's comments as to whether or not they liked a product, if they had a problem with the product, if there was you know, if they cut it, it could be broader than just that. Um, and, you know, we're looking, you know, some of the, some of the ideas that, at least from the technical standpoint, is how do you get systems to help you parse this data and help you identify where there really could be a safety issue. Um, and that, and that's, that's kind of the, the end state that we're looking at. My time has expired, but I will just add to that conversation that seems like a good place for retailer reporting. Commissioner Mohorovic. Nicely done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Atkins, Mr. Hoffman, I want to also uh, echo my appreciation for this document, 
for the details provided therein. I think, Mr. Hoffman, you emphasized the change in year over year, what's different with this document in terms of how it looks or how it reads. It's been mentioned by my, by my colleagues. I appreciate that. And all the work from all the staff that went into the development of it. But uh, I also very much want to demonstrate my appreciation for Commissioner Robinson. I really believe, Commissioner, that you elevating the importance of the timing of this document as well as the level of detail helped provide some momentum behind the situation where we stand today. So I very much appreciate your leadership there. I believe getting into getting on regular order uh, is a demonstration of regulatory best practices. So uh, I, I really appreciate where we are today and what we're looking at. Uh, I do want to mention something that Commissioner Adler had to say about uh, table saws and I'm sympathetic to his disappointment with where we are on the, on the project, but I do want to mention, Commissioner, um, your personal efforts on this subject, what you do b behind the scenes to get to an acceptable position to mitigate this hazard is something that I think very few recognize or appreciate. I know it won't come as great solace to you, but I do want to tell you how much I appreciate that. You do it in your typical modest uh, quiet fashion without seeking any praise or, uh, or recognition of it. Uh, and you're very, very uh, generous with sharing your thoughts on it. So uh, I hope you appreciate that. And you mentioned that your staff suggested you curtail your remarks because they sounded uh, snarky, uh, like a snarky rant. And if my staff suggested I don't say what I planned on saying, I wouldn't have much to say if they said don't say the, something that will come off as a snarky rant. Uh, the chairman mentioned something in terms of, uh, I don't know if it's a correct way of putting it in a distraction of resources from our operating plan. Uh, Mr. Borlace, you mentioned that there were five staff years that were dedicated to projects or efforts that were unforeseen in our operating plan. Is that right? <coughs> correct. So fa five staff years, I know the chairman tried to get to putting five staff years in uh, a perspective. Uh, can you give it another shot in terms of five staff years, just a general, not holding you to it, but your best guess in terms of what kind of, a, of uh, an unforeseen distraction um, that was imposed upon the staff and therefore impacted uh, staff's work and time to get other foreseen projects in the operating plan completed? Sure. I mean, I you know, so in terms of staff years, I guess a perspective would be that, um, I mean, I'm just looking behind me, but that would be as if half of the special assistance. Behind you, okay. I'm just behind you. <laughs> half the special assistants, you know, were gone for a year, or for some of our divisions or directorates, even, I mean, that is half of our directorate of economics. So, you know, putting it in context of five staff years, it is as if suddenly, you know, there were five people that we thought we were going to have in FY16 working on projects that were not then just there. Right. Now, in terms of allowing the staff time to be distracted away from commission approved uh, projects, how is, that, uh, how is that determined? Who makes that call to take a project, to take staff time and effort away from something that the commission has decided through either the original operating plan or the mid-year review to dedicate time and effort towards and then have those resources to be rededicated elsewhere. Yeah, I, I just I want to be clear. Um, I think when George was describing uh, some of these unplanned activities, um, <clears throat> these are activities that we try our best to anticipate and allow some level of uh, when they're developing the plans for this year and they're estimating the number of staff months that it'll take to do the job that historically in EXHR and the technical directorates, they set aside a certain amount of time for these unforeseen things, petitions, compliance support, you know, all these different areas. And I think what George was trying to say is, well, we thought it was going to be this and we had a bunch more in those areas and we had you know we had you know we had to support compliance and their support uh, we were required to do some of these petition pieces so that's where the uh, the shifting of that focus is but it, it it's not so much a not following the direction of the commission it's just that inability to predict what's going to come in for things that we can't so the project work 
we define it well in advance, the rulemaking activities, and we do our best to predict that. But the things that we cannot predict, th those are the issues where we get that uncertainty in the, in the staff months. And I can appreciate that, and I can appreciate how that comes up. I guess in terms of my consideration where I think it might be worth discussing a little bit is to what extent uh, do we allow ourselves or does staff allow those resources to be re rededicated? Where is the, is there a threshold period at which point in time someone would say, well, this particular incident, this uh, consumer product safety crisis emerged, we have to, we, ha we have to address it, but it'll have a certain level of impact on what was already considered and approved by the commission in the operating plan. It's, the threshold is certainly not five full staff years. Um, what is the comfort level with which staff is willing to redirect away from the commission approved direction in, in resource dedication uh, before it, uh, it should come up to the commission uh, and or if this is an element that is uh, identified in a particular directive and I'm not aware of it, I apologize for it and you can direct me to that, uh, but I'm not familiar with it if it does exist. What, what is that threshold where it becomes uncomfortable that we're moving away from uh, express commission um, uh, direction in terms of staff resourcing? I, I think as far as a process goes, um, the mid-year process is part of that feedback mechanism. Fair. So we make that assessment at mid-year. Now, that's once throughout the year. Um, and you will see not just the money issues that we reallocate, but also where projects that we anticipated getting done, we need to readjust. Um, and so I think as a process, that's where we come back to the commission and say, we thought we could get all this done. Here's where we're at, and, and we need to adjust. Excellent. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Commissioner Romero Horopic, just in terms Please. of, I know you described them as uh, distra distractions. Well, okay. Um, okay. Unforeseen uh, resource, uh, unresourced activities. Okay, so uh, certainly um, uh, Dwayne Ray did give some background on, on, on that in terms that there are things that are, are planned and there are things that are not planned. Um, but when do we make a decision to not do, do something? And I think when we have, just as an example, tip overs with IKEA, um, certainly with hoverboards, those were very major projects. And we certainly felt that the supportive uh, from the commission that we should engage in those. And we certainly shared with the commission uh, where we were in those projects. So I only use those as two examples of things that we felt that were critical to um, accomplish and take the necessary resources to, to do those. Is there a directive or something along those lines that we were following, I would probably say say no. It was it was a judge a judgment, and we knew that those were important areas to address. Not only certainly from our mission, um, but we certainly felt as though we had the support of the commission in moving those forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh, what also would be helpful is uh, as much as you'll see a lot of the discussion today when we're talking about resourcing items. It's usually not a matter. Usually, it's usually not a matter of uh, the commission uh, not wanting to resource a particular project. I've found through going through this exercise, it's more a matter of opportunity costs. If we had an unlimited budget, if we had more money to spend, we would spend it in this area, but we have to make tough choices. So when the situations do come up, and I appreciate Mr. Ray's uh, comment that we have mid-year to make those adjustments, and I think that is a reasonable amount of time, please uh, give us the understanding of what will be sacrificed uh, to the best that you can make those estimates when we're going to uh, redirect our, uh, our, our resources in ways that are not foreseen by, uh, by the operating plan. Uh, but uh, at that point in time, I've got too many questions on specific matters, Mr. Chairman, so I think it's a good time for me to pause and uh, wait for the next round. Thank Great. you. So we'll continue the next round. Uh, just picking up where Commissioner Mohorovic was, Ms. Atkins, uh, clearly though, not only does the commission bless the specific activity on the rulemaking side, but the com commission has historically blessed through delegations and directive compliance to use that discretion, meaning just to fill out that picture, it's not as if staff has gone off on frolics and detours without the commission having provided a blessed framework to do so, correct? That would be accurate. Okay, just want to fill that picture out. Thank you. Turning to 
that blend of compliance actions, picking up on the phone recall from last week and our EXHR activities, I am concerned about lithium ion batteries and how many recalls we do see and where this is going. And today it's lithium ion. Tomorrow it's going to be something else. They're going to be smaller. They're going to be more malleable. They're going to be more powerful. And right now you see on airplanes that you have an issue with some of these loose batteries, external batteries ending up in seats. We saw that last week with an airline. There have been reports that in with the larger seats that have more folding pieces to them that these batteries can get caught in them and end up creating fires on airplanes. I noticed in the operating plan, Dr. Borlase on page 14, that staff has in the project description 21518, electrical hazards, voluntary standards and codes. The last bullet point is study and scope, study of scope of unprotected lithium ion and lithium polymer cells and batteries. I would like to see, and this will be an amendment that I will circulate for the decision, I would like to see a more thorough examination by staff of the state of affairs of lithium ion batteries. What is the regulatory landscape? What are the voluntary standards issues? Is it that we are seeing products that don't comply with the standards? Do we see products that do, but there are regulatory or voluntary standards gaps? Uh, where are we on partnering? And I see Mr. Simmons from Compliance who did, has done a phenomenal job of working with our sister agencies. Where are we on partnering with the FAA and other agencies that have oversight, DOT? And then where are we, and you might have to bring in our international programs office for this, where are we in partnering with other countries and trying to get our arms around lithium ion batteries? So can you give me a sense as to the resources that you have dedicated in the proposed operating plan based on that project sheet? And then I think we'll have a further discussion as to what it would take to try to fulfill the request that I'll make through the amendment if it is adopted. So certainly uh, from staff's perspective, we see these, we'll call them high energy storage devices, lithium ion, lithium polymer, et cetera. We've seen through uh, compliance activities over the last few years, um, also from our you know, work supporting that and other research, the, the issues related to, and we, staff's identified this as one of the you know, top hazards that needs to be addressed. So in the 17 op plan, specifically on the voluntary standard and then this other supporting activity, we do have the resources already for Doug Lee, specifically in electrical engineering, others in engineering sciences, laboratory sciences and EXHR to do engagement with UL and other standards development organizations on not just the batteries themselves, but then the systems. We've seen from hoverboards, for example, that You've got to look at the system, not just the battery, and for all the different emerging systems, for lack of a better way to describe it, that a lithium ion battery or lithium polymer battery or any of these other high energy batteries are in, how do we kind of build that, those layers of safety, starting at the cell level to the battery pack level all the way to the system level? So uh, hopefully you open to working with my office to try to come up with what the resource implications would be beyond what you have allocated in the operating plan. And I think you mentioned Mr. Lee, yeah. who has led many of our electrical investigations, electrical engineering investigations, and the challenge is right there of as these batteries continue to become an issue, he would get pulled off of preparing one of these reports to try to do the investigations, and that's part of the challenge. But I do think the public has an expectation that somebody in the United States government, and I think we are the somebody who's most appropriate, is looking at this and is thinking ahead as to how we can get on top of it and provide assurances. This is not a product or its usage in a product they might end up getting here, unfortunately. But right now, people shouldn't expect that when they use one of these that this provides, uh, presents a risk of their house burning down. That's a, that is unreasonable. And so I do think that we need to do more work and really get ahead of this issue. I want to pivot now to Section 15J of the Consumer Product Safety Act. I noticed in the operating plan that there is a notice to propose rulemaking identified. Can you give us a sense as to what 15J, so to speak, we should be expecting to see? The mandatory standards table, page 9. Substantial product hazard list 15J rule. Staff had a 
NPR went in the 2017 performance budget request, but staff does not have a 15J proposed rule in the 2017 operating. Got budget. it. So I was looking at the wrong column. And if we were to be able to fund it, what would be next? Um, we'd have to go back and look at a specific one. Part of the issue was after we had completed the work that we did last year on the holiday lights and um, the extension power cords, staff didn't have a product or a candidate readily available, so that's why we did not recommend a 15J and 17. Okay, so at some point, if your office could follow up, though, with my office as to what those items might be, because I, I feel like I remember from previous years there was a long list, and it's possible that some of those items may have taken care of themselves, but it is a great tool that we have when appropriate. Oh, yes, and absolutely we'll follow up with you. Thank you. Uh, I also see that the federal toy standard is due to be updated this year. Do we have a sense as to maybe you can just give us the top line as to what kind of changes that we should see? I don't actually have all the different changes in front of me. Um, staff, though, has been working with the ASTM 963 committee all the way through and providing inputs all the way through so that we're ready when we do get the uh, re notification or revision from ASTM to be able to turn that package around quickly and get it to the Commission because it's on a short timeline. Got it. And do we have at least a basic sense as to whether or not these are safety-related changes or may other sort of cleanup items? It, there's a combination of both, but uh, staff's been engaged on the safety items to make sure if we had any concerns, we were voicing them early. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Boyle, our General Counsel, if I can just ask you a quick question about an item in the package having to do with updating our Freedom of Information Act regulation. Could you give us a brief sense, please, as to why we're doing that now and what we should expect to see? Sure. Um, Congress uh, passed legislation that went into effect in June to update the FOIA. Um, it had a number of um, provisions that uh, to increase transparency, but one of the things uh, uh, the legislation requires is us to update our FOIA regs to reflect the changes in the FOIA statute amendments. And clearly we've had conversations over the years about changes that we can initiate that would modernize our FOIA process. Is that an, a vehicle for that or is staff looking exclusively at whatever Congress required? Right now we're focusing on um, implementing what Congress required. I don't see why it wouldn't be a vehicle to do other things once we're opening up our regulations. I think that opportunity is there. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adler. Um, thank you. And just a couple of points that the chairman made that I did want to follow up on. I hope that when we're reviewing our FOIA regs that one of the things we'll look at is the fees that we charge. I think uh, it, it's, it's a good thing that we don't charge people who don't have much money for FOIA requests, but people who can afford it, uh, I think we're doing that uh, subsidizing folks who don't need subsidizing. So I would urge you to look at the fees that we charge for FOIA requests. Uh, and actually, that is one of the elements of the uh, amendments, and so we will be looking at that. I'm delighted to hear that. I also wanted to mention about batteries. Uh, it's interesting to hear the chairman talk about it. Uh, this past week, I went out and talked to a group called PPAI, Product Placement Association, uh, and unfortunately, I missed the morning speaker, and it was somebody from a group uh, that is the Battery Trade Association. I mean, we have trade associations for everything. I think there are trade associations for the flammability of belly button length. But whatever it is, there are trade associations. But this is a critical group that I hope that we will follow up on because over the years I've noticed that it isn't just hoverboards. Uh, it isn't just the iPhones. It's laptops. Uh, we've had endless recalls involving those products. And so I think jumping to the more broad omnibus approach is a really sensible one, and uh, I haven't seen the chairman's proposal, but I have a feeling that I will probably uh, support it because I think it's really a good idea. Um, I also did want to just make a quick comment uh, in concurrence with Commissioner Mohorovic. Um, we're always choosing between our children <laughs> when it comes to uh, doing what the commission does. It's always a resource trade-off, and I'm I think one of the better things I've seen happen at this commission over the years, we're not perfect, is if somebody wants to propose something, we're always asking, what is it we're giving up? 
and we have to be prepared if we're coming in to make a proposal to say we'd like to see this, but that may mean this slips, and we ought to do that explicitly. So I commend Commissioner Mohorovic for reminding us of that. So uh, I did have one question, and I'm sorry this is the, the lighthearted question of the day, but if you look at page three, I'm always intrigued by these um, items. So on page three, if I can actually turn to it, towards the bottom of the page, I see under this SO 2.2 .2, uh, two categories, one of which says that we're going to have a 90 percent uh, foreign-based representatives indicating increased understanding after CPSC training, and below that, I see that we're going to try for 90 percent for the percentage of foreign regulatory agencies who indicate increased know-how. And I'm wondering, what's the difference between increased understanding and increased know-how? But, but more than that, if I might, <laughs> I realize that, that th it's important at times to try to measure the unmeasurable. And so it, I think it's fine that we're doing this. I'm just curious, is there a metric? Are we going to give them a quiz to see how much they know? Or is this just, uh, they, we've run them through the training and, and we think that it's been successful? To your point, um, uh, Commissioner, we probably will give them a, um, a survey, a feedback form uh, at the conclusion of the, the training activities. And hopefully the questions that are provided to them will give us some insight as to whether they have uh, gained the knowledge uh, that we were intending. Yeah, and I think that's a perfectly appropriate approach. I, I wouldn't hold my breath as saying that that will necessarily be the absolute uh, picture of what's happening. It's the same way when you ask voters, are you planning on voting? Oh, yeah, and then you compare the number of people who say they're going to or even who say they have with the actual vote turnout, and there's a discrepancy. But I think it's, first of all, I think the underlying project's a, a very good one. Um, I did also uh, just a, a quick question on FTEs. Uh, I noticed on page 40 that we are looking to have 90 percent of our FTEs utilized, and I have an impression that we've done better and better in recent years in coming close to it. We'll never hit it perfectly, and I'm not sure we ever should hit it perfectly, but uh, am I correct in saying we've been coming closer and closer to hitting our FTE target, and is there some new approach that we've adopted that has enabled us to do that, or is my premise wrong? So I guess I would say two things to that. One, we have gotten closer and closer to consuming all of our available FTE. In fact, I think it exceeds 90 percent if that gives you a warm and fuzzy. It does. It yeah. does. Congratulations. The other thing that we're doing is the budget office. We haven't implemented it yet, but they're working with the Human Resources Office to try to get more fidelity on, this is a little bit esoteric, I apologize, but sort of fund certifying each position. And what that will allow us to do is to really push the envelope to maximize staffing throughout the year. Uh, we're hoping to implement that uh, new approach in, in FY 2017. We'll be talking to all of you more about it once we have the details in place. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Wolfson. Uh, so, George, you can step down for just a second. Uh, we try to bring in pitch hitters from time to time. And, uh, Mr. Wolfson, it's my understanding that uh, in recent years we, you have gone out of your way to try to build in some evaluation component for some of the education campaigns. And again, that's one of those things that consumes resources. So you're spending money to see what you've done as opposed to spending money to do it. But uh, I, I, was hoping that, I was hoping that you could give me a brief description of uh, which programs we've built in an evaluation component and what it is precisely that we're evaluating. So to your point about the question about the training on the foreign level, we would like to be able to do some of the same things at the domestic level. We know we have a lot of our field staff that go out and speak publicly. A lot of people at headquarters do the same. It'd be nice to get a sense in the aftermath of that speech, that training session, what was the response? The word usefulness is throughout the strategic plan as it pertains to communications. Was the presentation, was the, the nature of the information useful? That is kind of a no-cost approach. You'll take OMB review. There is another activity we like to do formally. We've been sensitized 
through the feedback from the commission to get more survey results. Um, I will have some results to share with the commission hopefully very soon from the National Awareness Survey that was completed this fiscal year, but we want to build on that. So we are hoping to work um, off of a contract that I know EXHR is considering to do some more formal survey work. Uh, we feel good about our reach, but we need to know how effective it is. Um, so is it the right platform that we're communicating on? Are we communicating at the right grade level? We're very sensitive to certain people's educational levels and the words we use. We can be highly technical at this agency, but it may not serve us well. The only way to get a sense of that is through survey activities. Yeah, I mean, the perfect uh, evaluation tool is that you see injuries or fatalities drop. That, that gets to be a major challenge and a major confound. But you can certainly move from impressions to awareness, and it sounds like you're, you're making that and, and doing it as usual in a very thoughtful way. Um, and I guess, uh, actually, I think I'm going to stop at this point. I have a couple of additional questions, but I can see they would use up more of my time. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Forlice, Dr. Forlice. I just wanted to I just wanted to follow up on where we left off when my time ran out, ran out the last time. You told me that there's a voluntary standard and you don't have the specifics that, uh, that IEEE has with respect to um, biometrics and RFID technology. And as you and I discussed, um, what what you're envisioning this um, standard would do with respect to specific products is somewhat like the compartment requirements for coin cell batteries in electronics that as the voluntary standard comes up sort of a standard um, voluntary standard with respect to that kind of device would be applied to a specific product. So I guess um, what I'd like to know is whether, first of all, whether CPSC staff has looked at these the standards for these new technologies for biometrics and RFID, because I'm thinking of it sort of um, with respect to child resistant or child proof packaging of certain products. And as you know, I was optimistic that that new project that was added might include that. But have we looked at that? And do we have any intention at this point in this op plan of including that as, and I guess included in that question is whether we have the expertise to do that? So, Steph very recently started looking at. RFID and biometrics and to your point they were looking at them in the context of what they usually call horizontal standards i.e. Right. it's a standard that can be applied across I knew there a was a term for it number number of things so um, they just started to look at that but uh, as we discussed from the first blush you know staff didn't uh, see anything in there to that was worthy of proposing as an addition to the voluntary standards table Okay. Um, I want to make a comment, um, and I always love it when I find something that Commissioner Burkle and I agree on, and this third-party platform data is um, a, a very interesting um, proposition right now, and I'm absolutely delighted that we both have it as a list of priorities, and then the milestone on page 24 says that, uh, quote, a report on solutions for submission of incident data from third-party platform e-commerce sites will be prepared. And I just wanted to say that um, way beyond, uh, I, I think what hasn't been mentioned is that that these types, these third-party platform non-traditional retailers, if you will, did not exist and could not have been anticipated when our statute was passed. And so, and they're very much a reality in the 21st century marketplace. And we, when we were looking at retail reporting, um, I, it, out of my office for the first time, and I wish it had been I, but it wasn't, um, Ms. Bramble suggested, well, these retailers already have a duty under our statute to report to us under 15B. Why don't we try to do this kind of reporting with respect, with respect to third-party platform providers? And it was really, I confess, the first time I had really focused on the fact that so many, we not only have exclusive but people who are selling exclusively as third-party platform providers, but so many of our huge retailers are using their websites for marketing in this way so that you've got one-stop shopping portals. So I know this is the next phase for um, American consumers, and um, it's becoming more and more ubiquitous and something that if we don't find a way of getting industry to cooperate with us, we've got a real problem because under our statute, they... they um, 
certainly st could strongly argue that they have absolutely no duty to report to us, and I think that's been the position that we've that we've taken so far. So I am delighted that that we have are going to use this, and I think it's an excellent opportunity, and hopefully. That what we've what we've learned from retail reporting is going to be able to inform the ways in which we can work with these third-party platform providers, and and hopefully in a collaborative, non-adversarial way, we can we can get some of them on board with respect to reporting to us, and then we can figure out what else we have to do to get that information. Um, with respect to the the nice data, I just I would just like to say that I was very very excited. Um, about to see the enhancements that are set forth on uh, page 12 um, that, uh, that, that, at, that have three new areas that we're doing. And I do have some questions on that. I'm not sure, since I don't see anybody from EPI here, um, whether the, somebody um, who is here can answer this. But one of, the, one of the, um, the enhancements that is listed on page 12 under 11179 is that we would implement a new mode of collecting hazard scenario information in addition to telephone interviews. And I'm just wondering if anyone who is here knows exactly what that project is describing. That project. That, that project's looking at uh, trying to, or looking at developing online, has a uh, collection of the information vice having to make phone calls as follow up for nice uh, reports. Okay, and on the on the enhancement that's that's described as assessing the fe feasibility of statistical modeling of nice injury data in conjunction with U.S. Census Bureau, Bureau and HCUP data from HHS, including sociodemographic graphic group injury estimates. I was absolutely delighted to see that, and I'm wondering if you could explain to me a little bit more about the information that's contained in the social demographic group inquiry estimates. That detail I'll have to get back to you on. Okay. The specifics I really think of the socio-decanism. Yeah, I really think we could get that information. We could so much better target the, the communications that we make also. Um, and then uh, the third one is expanding the length of the narrative fields and modifying the race and ethnicity variables to align with those used in the U.S. Census Bureau. And I was wondering if you know how those would help us. I bet you're going to get back to me on that. I can help you on ah, the um, on the one um, expanding the narrative field. So that's a limitation on the database size, right. um, which uh, by increasing the size of that field, they'll be able to capture you know, more data. So right now it's cut off at, I, I don't know what exactly, number of characters, but that will allow more descriptions in that narrative field that we currently are limited by. And the modification of the race and ethnicity variable aligned with the U.S. Census Bureau? Yeah, I, I think that has more to do with being able to capture and report back effectively on that um, and modifying the system to do that. But okay, we will get back sense. to you okay. specifically. <laughs> the, uh, okay, that's fine. Um, I do have a couple questions, and I see Mr. Ralph is here, so we, I'm not sure if he's going to need um, to answer these. But on page 39, we have a description of um, an IT customer satisfaction survey. And I don't know if that's describing customers within the agency or outside the agency. Welcome, Mr. Office. Hello, thank you. Uh, yeah, this one is primarily looking at internal agency, agency customer evaluations. That's terrific. Um, so, the, because I know that that's been a problem in the past in, some, in terms of coordination, coordinating the party who's going to be using the IT and and IT, and I, I applaud you for that. That's that's outstanding. Um, the other thing, the other question I have for you before you go away. Um, the electronic monthly reports. Do you think those are th that we're going to be able to be able to do that this year? That's that's the uh, that's the plan. So as as Mr. Ray mentioned earlier, we're in the final phases of issuing the um, of the procure procurement actions for that, and uh, the anticipated period of performance for that is within the next fiscal year. Excellent. 
And just one more question for you. The last item on page 39, um, that's 2017 M53, says, quote, an evaluation of product identification capabilities and of the benefits of standardization completed. What is that? So this is evaluating, um, there's a, it's specifically looking at um, GTIN as a universal product identifier and potential benefits for uh, applying that to systems in use within the agency to promote um, a alignment of, of uh, products by identification, specific identification of products across different program areas. Um, the reason why there's some need for alignment is because we also have other sources of information that come in that are related to product identification, things like uh, tariff codes and also uh, NICE data elements that have their own specific uh, requirements and needs. They operate within some, some specific contexts as well, and so this effort will be looking at um, how we can, how and whether it's effective for us to use a standard for product ID and also rationalize that with these other product description right. categorization standards. Right, so it's standardized. Excellent. Thank you. I'm out of time, but thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Burkle. Yeah. I was about just, to give you more time. <laughs> because we agree on data. <laughs> um, I have a, a couple questions for Dr. Borlase. I don't know where they are. Um, we are going to be receiving, the Commission's going to be receiving a briefing package on um, ROVs, and I understand it's not going to come with any recommendation uh, on rulemaking. And I'm just wondering, so that um, ROV, that rule, uh, the proposed rule is on the books, how do we get that? Maybe this is a question for OGC. Um, how would one go about taking, getting that rule out of um, the... And the staff would have to submit a package to the commission explaining the reasons why um, they would not support continuing rulemaking and whatever those recommendations would be. And if the recommendation, uh, uh, they would have to support the record for termination and submit that to the commission for a commission vote. And so the briefing package that we're going to get regarding the ROVs, is that going to include the information that uh, Ms. Boyle just mentioned? The scope of the briefing package on ROVs is specifically just a evaluation of the voluntary standard, both the recently published ROVA and OPI voluntary standards. It is specifically addressing only two questions as staff puts it together. Does staff expect the voluntary standard to be effective in addressing the hazards related to occupant protection, stability, and uh, steering on ROVs? And do we expect that those two voluntary standards will be widely adopted? And then following that, then we have to request again a briefing package from staff that would say whether or not and advise us whether or not uh, we could terminate this rulemaking? I mean, I, it's, it's a question of process, but the main point is that if uh, staff presents a package, the Commission can consider that package as the basis for a decision making. You would have to then direct staff. There would be an FR notice involved, so there would be another process okay. point. Um, that we would have to notify the public of the reasons for termination and the support behind that, so there would be an FR notice involved. So there, yes, the answer is yes, there would be another process point. But that process does not have to include another briefing package. We could maybe surmise from what staff gives us in that original package. Well, I, I guess I don't want to um, prejudge what's in the briefing package. I guess it depends on what's in the pre briefing package. But um, if s the uh, commission could direct staff to, uh, based on its reading of the briefing package, to proceed with the termination package, in which case the information necessary for a termination package would be represented to the commission along with an FR notice, a proposed FR draft FR notice. Thank you very much. Um, on page 25 of the Ops Plan, it talks about the e-filing program and the pilot that is now um, currently up and running. Is there uh, uh, any idea or estimation of what the cost of the e-filing program will be for fiscal year 2017?
So I think um, as we presented it, we um, the current pilot finishes uh, hopefully at the end of December. And then based on an evaluation of um, the alpha pilot, as we've been calling it, um, and assuming that is um, positive and staff feels like we need to move on to the beta pilot as we've described it, we would come to the commission um, and, and re uh, recommend proceeding with that beta pilot. Um, at this point, um, you know, any kind of resources that are associated with that, we don't believe they'll be significant to move on to the next phase because a lot of that is about you know, this this phase was a very small number of en entities. We were looking at expanding it to a larger group. Um, but we would, at that time, if if resources were a constraint within that, we would put that forward. And and we're and timing wise, we're looking more spring time before we we think we could even be at that point. Okay, the, that point being completion uh, of the alpha pilot and then the evaluation of the alpha, and then any kind of recommendation on whether to move forward in in, uh, in the beta and further. And you feel you have the resources to get to that point at least. I, I'm not going to say that at this point in time. I think I, we need to get through the evaluation piece, and I think if we did, we would come forward through a mid-year process. And, and no, I, I mean to, to get to the evaluation piece. You you feel you have the resources to do that? Yeah, I think as we're as we're currently planned in the uh, in the draft version of this plan, we can get through the uh, alpha. I wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, RAM and the expansion of the RAM. Um, you know, fondly referred to as 2.0, but it, it is the attempt to bring RAM in-house so we can uh, make some of the changes ourselves. Um, do we, I guess, let's start with where we're at. If you could give, provide us with a status of the transition from RAM to bringing RAM in-house. So we're, I'll say, at the... Um, almost at the end of the cycle as far as um, the kind of user acceptance testing that is done um, with our import team. We've done several um, uh, tests at ports uh, throughout the country to make sure how it's performing in the field. Um, we have what I'll call a punch list of items that still need to be addressed, and I do know the team's working through that. So I think as far as um, transitioning to what we've been calling our 2.0 version, um, we're we're getting very close to completing that, and um, and the sense that I have is that we're getting, you know, we're we're um, we're in a much better place. You know, like any software development, there's a process, and um, we're at the end of that process at this point in time. So you're you're comfortable with the functionality of of the new RAM? We're almost there. I, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to give a full comfort level. The team is not fully through the testing, but I believe we're on, a, on track to get to that point. And so when we uh, eventually we make that transition, and I understand there's going to be overlapping for a period of time. That's correct. Um, when we make that transition, then will there be a requirement to have a third-party vendor, or can we handle that ourselves? So I... I uh, I think the best way to describe that is we we were transitioning from the leased version to the own version, but we still have support requirements that we seek outside contractors to help in. Um, so that's part of that operation and maintenance budget that's built into um, in, into the RAM support piece. Um, but what this functionality will allow us to do is it gives us more ability to. Um, adjust and customize the targeting rules. And that's probably one of the biggest um, biggest changes from the 1.0 to 2.0 is that gives um, us the ability to adjust that. Thank you. I have uh, one last question I think I can fit in my time that's left. Um, on page 23 of the ops plan, item number 34381, the internet surveillance program support. Can I... Um, I mean, I could read what's on page 23, but can you explain to me what the scope of that is? What will um, what will motivate surveillance of one type or another? Or what how that is going to be um, run? 
So th this is a this is a continuation of the program that we already have in place, um, primarily run out of our um, out of our field directorate, um, and this you know continues the process of looking at um, on online re retailers, um, different sites um, where you know either recalled products um, or products that would not meet a standard are being sold. Uh, and taking appropriate action um, on those items. Products that don't meet a voluntary standard? No, I'm, I'm uh, for example, let's say there's a site selling uh, children's clothes with drawstrings. We would identify the seller that that is a uh, violation of a, of, of a rule that the commission has and ask them to take it down and, and educate them on that, on that process. Thank you. Um, my time is expiring, but I do want to say um, to Dr. Borlase that I still I didn't get in my first round of questioning um, the follow-up with the concerns regarding the voluntary standards that Commissioner Adler referred to, and I think maybe offline I'd like to hear those with a, peeding, a meeting with um, Ms. Edwards to hear what the concerns are with the voluntary standards and our participation. We'll work with you on that. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question uh, surrounds the hazard of furniture tip over and the subject of uh, furniture tip over and starting with the Anchor It campaign. What is the level of funding in the FY17 operating plan for the Anchor It campa campaign? Commissioner, I appreciate that question because the cycle that we're in is a challenging one. As I indicated yesterday, we, you granted us as the commission mid-year funds. It was not until yesterday that that contract was signed. So Kim Dulick is doing an outstanding job as project lead. Widmeyer Communications is a very good firm. They're serving us well. We have $288,000 now to proceed with this last week and go into next year. That is not enough to go through the entire fiscal year. My concern is lost momentum because that campaign is getting results that we saw with the pool safely campaign three or four years into it. So it's very encouraging what we have to work with, but we could do more with more. So at this point, the question is, you know, do we just need to do the best we can with the funds we have? Or are we back into that cycle of coming to you at mid-year and saying we've depleted our funds? You're an advocate, so I hate to treat you this way, but in Jeopardy, they make the contestant answer the, answer the question in the form of a question. Can you answer the question in the form of a dollar amount? How much money? <laughs> and I didn't intend to ask you this, sure. but let's be honest here. How much money in FY17 do we have planned or recommended for the Anchorage campaign? FY17 operating plan. There's, there's no money at the base level in OCM's budget, but we have indicated um, in some documentation that to go above the base, we recommend another $400,000 to fully support the campaign. 0, 0.00 in FY17 for the award-winning Anchor campaign. Now, Ms. Adkins, for what activities do we have underway then if we're not recommending any funding for an i &E campaign for Anchor It? What activities do we have underway to mitigate the hazard associated with furniture that is compliant with voluntary standards tipping over? I'll certainly ask Scott to follow up on, on this, but the $250,000, that's correct, that we have that will get us through some portion of FY17, although it was um, awarded in FY16, uh, will take us through some, some portion uh, of, the, of the year. Uh, when that is, is over, then uh, staff will certainly um, come back and determine in mid-year what might be available in terms of a proposal, and then the commission can consider. My point is the following. The reason I was asking for it, what are the mitigation strategies for the product that's currently out in the marketplace, because this is one of those typically vexing situations where we've got our, our, our usual and maybe most effective approaches to mitigation can be in the standards arena through mandatory rulemaking or voluntary rulemaking, but that will have little if no impact on product that's in the marketplace. We know of dozens of fatalities uh, associated with product that complies with voluntary standards, 
Uh, so therefore, it limits our compliance efforts. Are we going to do nothing about that other, that product where we know um, is in the marketplace, but consumers may continue to, to um, use them in unsafe circumstances by putting televisions on top, et cetera? Um, and we just, we have no other approach if we're deciding not to fund Anchor It in 2017? Uh, but that's what I was saying, uh, Commissioner. Um, if we have funds that take us through a portion of FY17 and there are funds available through the mid-year and that is, is proposed and the Commission signs off on that, then we would certainly move forward with that. Are you committing that that would be the top of the list of staff recommended mid-year funding levels? I can't commit to that at this at this stage. Certainly, staff would propose um, a list of, of product. Of but that's what you're projects. suggesting. How, how long through the current fiscal year is the is the existing resources going to run through? We will do all we can to stretch it as far as possible. This this current fiscal year was In your best judgment. I, I mean, we need to think about trying to go three quarters of the way through the fiscal year based upon our current experience because. We, we ran out of adequate funds prior to coming to you at mid-year and seeking additional funds, and therefore we had that gap before funds were actually allocated to us. But, you know, lesson learned for us, we will do the best we can to go as far into the fiscal year as possible. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, the efforts of your office and working with your contractors on an award-winning campaign. But I think we currently have $288,000 left from FY16 appropriations to spend into FY17. What can we, what can, if we're going to uh, make a decision on our FY17 budget, how much can we reasonably and hope that there's money that we might be able to redirect towards this effort in mid-year? What's the, uh, how much length will, how much spend will we going to get through on that 288 in your best judgment? End of year, two quarters, I mean, not trying to be more specific than we can. Right. We, we will do the best we can to kind of look at the allocations of uh, placements for PSAs, um, other campaign activities related to development of more partners. Um, we'll try to be smart with those dollars. Just to, to give you a bit of a, a metric, um, for our National Awareness Survey, we went out and talked to 650 respondents, and we had a 33% response rate, an affirmative response rate, that they had heard about the campaign. That, that's a pretty good start for where we are this, thus far with that activity. So we're going to do all we can with the funds we have to get that to 40, 50 percent. Um, but I think if, you know, we, we view the campaign in terms of where we're at now with Pool Safely this many years, there's a lot of potential there for Anchor to, to build up to a highly, highly recognized campaign. I recognize you're going to do everything you can, and I applaud those efforts. But now I'll be very specific since it was difficult to get a dollar amount answer in terms of how much money we have allocated in FY17 for this campaign, which is zero dollars. In terms of, of the current spend, the $288,000 that we'll be using in FY17, in an answer of Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, FY17, when will those funds be fully used up? I think it's fair to say in Q3, to, to be realistic about our prior two years of experience, I think that's the best answer. Well, thank I can you. That wasn't so difficult. Um, and I hope uh, my colleagues will, will th in thinking about this hazard, as we come to a final deci decision on it in terms of meriting, as, uh, as Commissioner Adler pointed out, deciding among our children here, this uh, remains among the most severe. It's, uh, it's got a level of latency uh, that is not seen in the other hazards that we're trying to address. And of course, it addresses our most vulnerable populations. Um, and I will also point out that we have no other strategy other than Anchor It that is planned that we could reasonably be confident is being exerted to mitigating the hazard involving existing product that's in the marketplace that complies with vol voluntary standards. We know that there are continued fatalities from children that are, that are dying from being crushed from the furniture or TV tip over, and this is our only approach. Fortunately, we have an approach that's award-winning. And in terms of making decisions, uh, I appreciate Commissioner Adler pointing out the international program's efforts on capacity building. We've got a metric, and I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have made note of it had you not, Commissioner Adler, but we have a metric the percentage of foreign regulatory agency representatives indicating know-how know -how after CPSC training, as opposed to understanding after CPSC training. So 
what we're doing is we're determining that it's more important to train our international counterparts in, in how they can do a better job for their constituencies than putting funding towards anchor it. That is an olive branch towards a potential amendment. I hope my colleagues will consider that if you're looking for somewhere else. I would look there first. Uh, it's not that the international activities and capacity building for our foreign counterparts isn't laudable in some way, but certainly in terms of perspective, uh, I don't think it, it measures up. Uh, I'll yield at this point. I'm going to continue on the topic of tip overs, and there are a number of different areas that Commissioner Mohorovic got into, and I'm going to try to cover them. We obviously can't discuss publicly compliance actions, but we can point to the fact that we've already taken two compliance actions so far this calendar year on this hazard, and we may not be done. Fair to say, we may not be done. Now, I think what, if I heard Commissioner Mohorova correctly, he's distinguishing from a mitigation strategy between products that don't comply with the voluntary standard, which may or may not be the basis of our compliance actions, between and hazards from products that do comply with the voluntary standard. I, I, did I hear you correct? And I'll yield for that. What you heard me correct in, in suggesting and asking is specifically from staff's point of view what mitigation hazards they plan on employing towards product that complies with the voluntary standards. Not making a, a difference there, but in, in, in an honest assessment, what resources are to address that, knowing what can be disclosed and what cannot be disclosed. Got it. And I appreciate that, reclaiming my time, because that's the first time I think that we've at least publicly acknowledged, well, maybe as a group, concerns about product on the market that complies with the standard as opposed to product on the market that does not comply with the standard. Staff is due to send up soon a briefing package. I don't know what's in it. I don't think my fellow commissioners know what's in it, what their recommendations. But based on what I thought was absolutely outstanding work by underwriters, laboratories, and kids in danger, they have already identified test methods and changes, improvements to the voluntary standards that I think will make a huge difference. And yes, that doesn't get to product that's on the market right now that gets to future products, but I do think we need to pursue those. And I'm grateful that the staff, as part of soliciting, Commissioner Robinson mentioned this beginning, as part of soliciting input from the various offices, the one item that I did request that staff consider including in the operating plan was commencing rulemaking on tip overs, because I do think, based on that report by UL and KID, as well as other information, that we know enough now, including the recalls that we've done, we know enough now that we should be considering not only what the standard can evolve to, but how we can enforce that better. So I am very eager. I understand that there's other work that has to come before that, but I'm very eager, should the staff package warrant or confirm that those suspicions that we would uh, forcefully move in the direction of improving the standard, both through the voluntary standards process and if that's insufficient or compliance with it is insufficient, that we would move on the rulemaking. I do want to mention one other topic, uh, and Dr. Borlais, if you could please return to the table since this is in your purview. I did receive a, a request within the last week or two, and I think it's the first that we've gotten, at least that I'm aware of, from an outside party, or from any party for that matter, to have CPSC staff lead a voluntary standards technical effort, and it's in the area of sensors for athletic helmets and headgears. I was pleased to see it. I do think from the experience that I've had involved with youth sports that parents are desperate to have some type of assistance in figuring out what's going on with the impacts to their children's brains while they're playing sports. And I have serious concerns about the efficacy of the products that are on the market. I do think that they're misleading and that they provide a false sense of security to parents. There is no current voluntary standard to address the validity and repeatability of those standards. So can you just briefly walk us through how will stand staff now handle that request to have staff lead that effort? What's the process and, more importantly, the timeline on that, please? So uh, after the Commission approved the final rule on the 1031 uh, changes to the 1031, uh, 16 CFR 1031, staff developed and has an approved directive that provides the um, steps 
So with the request uh, within EXHR, and this is the step that we're still on, we're evaluating the request, and the request then um, comes with uh, documentation of reasons for or against, and there's a number of criteria that we evaluate. Um, the subcommittee that it's related to, the hazard that we're trying to address, where is the hazard we're trying to address compared to the other hazards? I guess, is it one of the more important hazards, for lack of a better way to describe it, we're trying to address at the time? And where does it fit in our parties, the commission's parties? That goes up to the executive director uh, for a call. I would say within a couple weeks is when it has to come out of EXHR to go to the executive director, but uh, by the directive, it's the executive director's final decision as to whether staff, and it's a request for a task group leadership. So in this case, we lead a task group. Thank you for that. And even if we don't end up leading it, and that's what the executive director decides, it's still in the operating plan as one of the voluntary standards, well, I'm guessing, is that under, for recreational headgear, is that, does that include sensors? Oh, abs absolutely. The reason we got requested to lead the task group is we sent a letter last fall requesting ASTM to form a task group. So I guess we should have seen that one coming right back around. But the specific request from ASTM is a direct result of a letter staff sent ASTM last fall. Great. So whatever the executive executive director's decision, it does sound like we'll continue to support that effort at a minimum. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Their uh, participation in the voluntary standard is still separate from whether or not we lead the task group. Great. Because I know that there's some excellent work out of the University of Ottawa and other institutions, mm -hmm. including, uh, I believe, from the gentleman who requested that we lead the task group to try to find some way to create a baseline standards for these products. So hopefully CPSC staff, whether in the leading capacity officially or unofficially, can play a major role in that. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to return to a point that Commissioner Mohorovic was uh, making. Uh, and let me say, I, I think tip overs is a serious issue. And I think you've done a good job of describing tip overs. I just want to point out something that's vexing to me about uh, doing out plan and budget, and that is as much as I would love to say that people who are staff who work in the international program could be reprogrammed to doing tip over. Uh, what we're talking about with the $400,000 is contract dollars. It's not staff resources. So if you, if you want to free up the $400,000, and I, I'm very sympathetic to doing that, what you have to do is find $400,000 in contract dollars to reprogram, and of course I've got a suggestion or two of my own in possibly different directions. Um, I did also uh, want to return to something that uh, Ms. Adkins said at the start, because I don't think we've sufficiently congratulated or applauded the tremendous work that you and the staff have done on the strategic plan. And the appendix to me is just a, a, an extraordinary thing to see it tr you trying to integrate the strategic plan into things like the op plan. So I'm wondering if you could just give me an overall impression of your feeling about how effectively the strategic plan has been and is being integrated into the Commission's work with respect to things like budget, operating plan, and mid-year. Uh, this was certainly our, our, our first, um, uh, I won't say exactly the first attempt, but certainly the one that has been presented to the, to the commission. Um, it was a very collaborative uh, activity to develop the strategic plan, um, certainly engaging um, the commission as well as the commission's, um, your staff. Um, and we really try to uh, engage uh, across the different functional areas within NCPSC. And I certainly have um, the impression that uh, there was a good job that was done in engaging in employees. Uh, what I'm concerned about um, is that there's a lot of work that was put in into it. We have a document. Uh, we have some, um, we will have an executive summary document as well as a brochure associated with that. Um, and I think my words were used, a living document, um, that we really want to develop an appropriate um, launch within CPSC um, so that this will not just sit on, on the shelf. Um, but this, to your, to your point, Commissioner Adler, this was the first major um, presentation of the strategic plan in a document that will guide us through the, certainly through FY, FY 6, 17. What I think so extraordinary about this is, in my experience of 
at least 40 years of reading strategic plans uh, is they're almost never the real driver of our of the way we organize our work. What typically happens at best is at the end of the process of doing an operating plan or a budget, somebody says, oh, yeah, we've got to go and make sure that uh, we can find X and Y in the strategic plan, and it's all done post hoc, where they go and say, oh, yeah, well, this, this kind of works for that part of the strategic plan. But if you really want to have a strategic plan work, it's got to be the lead element when you're trying to do things like budget and operating plan. And I could be wrong, but my impression is it, at least it feels like that's what's happened here. So, again, I congratulate you. I would also like, if I could add, uh, again, some work that FM has done to um, incorporate the strategic plan um, into um, our day-to-day -day activities. And if I could just have uh, Jay speak to that, because it does speak to your point. Please. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we really have taken uh, the executive director's direction to heart. And, you know, I wanted to just say we had one session back in August where we, when we were finalizing the operating plan, it was a four-hour session where we reverse engineered from the performance goals and initiatives in the strategic plan back to the operating plan, and that's what you see in the appendix. And we're really excited about carrying that same kind of process forward into the FY18 budget process that will happen over the next several months uh, in terms of our data reviews that we're doing on a biannual basis. Um, and then, again, we talked a lot about soliciting commissioner input and priorities. I see a lot of possibilities in that area as well and going back and saying, okay, once these planning processes start, how can we then pluck from the strategic plan? So a lot of really great ideas. I, I'm sure the staff really appreciate your compliment on that. So thank you for recognizing the work. Yeah, and please understand I am a longtime uh, skeptic about the value of strategic plans. I think they use up a lot more energy than, than the benefit we get from them, and this is one that to my delight, uh, it feels like all that work is, is justified. So congratulations. Congratulations to you and other folks. Um, this is apropos of nothing that I could find in the uh, uh, op plan, but it is something when I was hearing a question about um, as we're gathering data and issuing reports about the limitations of the software in terms of expanding data fields. And so I think I've made uh, clear to uh, Mr. Ray, that over time I would love when I read the compliance reports not to read words that are cut off uh, in mid-spelling, and it would also be, while I'm at it, uh, I'd love to see some spell check element added to the software. I realize this is old software, but that it's just an ongoing uh, annoyance that I have. Uh, the, the, the big question I would have at this point is turning to page 20 excuse me, page 14, and I'm looking at the older consumer safety hazards. Um, having been an older person for many years now, I think when I came to the commission I was already a senior citizen and I'm getting even more senior as time is going on. I know we do an annual report uh, or a biannual report on senior citizen hazards. Is this um, project 22640, is this going beyond the um, Portable bed rails, but it, and the annual report. But this is actually exploring additional ways to dedicate uh, resources to doing projects for senior citizens. It is uh, two two six four O's does include the uh, adult portable bed rails petition, but does include additional work. Specifically, what staff's looking on this year is work associated with multi generational homes. We know from the data that there's often uh, like what they have the sandwich generation older and younger in the same house now so we're looking at safety issues and there's some commonality of safety issues with uh, if you have multiple generations in the home older uh, citizens and young children for example fire escape making sure that everybody can get out of the house yeah, and uh, it is true that there's often an overlap between hazards uh, that attach to senior citizens and citizens at large, which is not quite the same issue when it comes to children. Children have unique hazards that impinge on them. But uh, one of the things that I think is so good about the work we do is that we, when we do our report on senior citizens, we isolate those products that produce injuries at a rate greater for senior citizens than for others, and that at least gives us a chance to focus our efforts. Uh, and it is my senior-itis that prevents me from remembering the statistic, but 
Uh, if you look at the percentage of senior citizens uh, in the population at large, it's growing, but the percentage of fatalities that, uh, that happen to senior citizens from products is dramatically disproportionate when it comes to senior citizens. So I'm always delighted to see us uh, doing that kind of work. And I, oh, uh, one, one last point, and that is with respect to a, a question that Commissioner Burkle raised about monitoring the Internet. I mean, the Internet is just exploding, and so my question is, do you feel comfortable that we have the correct level of resources dedicated to monitoring the Internet and that we have the appropriate compliance measures being taken to deal with um, the violations that we see? My sense is now that we just either send an email or we send a, a letter but have we developed a way of finding out whether there are significant bad actors on the Internet that we can monitor for compliance purposes? I think, um, as you pointed out, um, we, we do have a small team that, that focuses on this. So, um, you know, there's challenges with that, especially when you're dealing with, like, um, aftermarket sales of recalled goods, um, it, it's often difficult to, to deal with that. Um, you know, the, the challenge is um, also a, a tools. You know, we're limited on how much effort can we put into the numbers are, that are out there and what kind of um, activities. Um, with regards to if we receive uh, multiple repeat offenders and we believe we're able to identify things like that to that uh, extent we'll escalate that and uh, and and work with our um, uh, our general counsel's office for effective remedies as far as that goes yeah the only last comment i would make before my time expires is that i do seem to think that we have a fair number of repeat offenders when it comes to selling what they call children's playwear but what we call children's sleepwear and i'm glad that we continue to monitor that thank you Mr. Robinson. Mr. Wolfson, I have a couple questions for you. I, my first one is with respect to the Anchor It campaign. Um, it's no secret that my office has been intimately involved in trying to address the tip over hazard in on multiple fronts. Um, I know we measure impressions um, and um, I, my recollection is that you and I had a conversation at some point in the last few months about trying to find a better metric for the effectiveness of the anchor campaign rather than just people who see it but rather uh, whether we were actually altering people's behavior whether we were getting people to actually anchor their furniture um, for my first question is whether I'm recalling that correctly, and the second one is whether we've been able to find out any information about the effectiveness. So you're correct about our intent to endeavor to have such a survey. That speaks to the limitations that we have with the, the current budget for FY16 into 17. Part of our activities will be to develop such a survey. Now that will take time to get through OMB, uh, presumably, and it's expensive. So we want to do that. We want to take okay. this singular data point that we got from the Aware National Awareness Survey and build off. People are hearing about it, but are they acting upon it? So we need to be on both tracks, continuing to do our work to create that awareness, but assess whether awareness is translating into action. That's the key. Okay. I wasn't sure whether we'd had an opportunity to measure whether it was affecting people's behavior. Um, I would just like to, uh, to say um, on this, first of all, that I – um, I am in full agreement with the observations that Commissioner Mohorovic made about this being very much a latent hazard, about how many deaths we're seeing, not only with furniture that doesn't comply with the voluntary standard, but furniture that does comply with the voluntary standard. My, and, I, I, and I know um, that Chairman Kay has, has said what he can say about our compliance. Um, endeavors and about um, the ANPR. So I would certainly strongly disagree with Commissioner Mohorovic's observation that the Anchor campaign is the only effort we're making to address this hazard. I think, as I say, we've been trying on multiple fronts, but because of these observations I've heard from Commissioner Mohorovic, I would just say that I am 
uh, optimistic that he, his and my office can work to um, aggressively try to get a change in the voluntary standard to make it uh, the stability performance require, requirement much more robust, which I believe is the first and foremost way in which we should uh, be trying to prevent these deaths. The education campaign only goes so far for so many different reasons, but first of all, we have to make our furniture stable. So I look, uh, look forward to working with you on the, on the voluntary standard on that and, um, uh, and on the ANPR that staff will propose. Um, I have another question for you, um, Mr. Wolfson, and that is in the in uh, 2017 OP54, and I and I just spoke about the number of impressions from recalls. Um, this this I assume is coming from the recalling company's monthly reports. The no, impressions. This is, this is from our own monitoring service. Okay. So we were we were worried about double counting uh, in pr prior years. So right. We, pulled out just so the recall data, and okay. that is a 10 billion impression goal that we have. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and while that's an impressive number, let me just tell you my concern. I have watched now on multiple occasions when our staff, including you, um, is presented with a plan by a company of how they would like to conduct their recall, or sometimes it's a so-called recall and how strongly we push back because what they're proposing is not what we believe would best protect the consumer. You carefully negotiate what the press release should be. The commissioners approve the press releases that include what we believe at the CPSC needs to be in this recall program for consumers alternatives in order to protect the consumer. And then what I'll see is the initial message that goes out both from us and from Chairman Kay and from you and from the company is consistent with what we've agreed upon. And then what I watch as the daily clips come in is that the message gets eroded. And within a very short time, on multiple occasions, what I've seen is the message that the company is getting out there no longer conforms with what we negotiated with them, but rather only contains the portions that they brought to us at the get-go and that we said were insufficient. And that's very troubling to me. So what I wonder, and I, and I bring these, the, the two examples up only because, um, because our most visible recalls of late have been the IKEA recall and the um, the Samsung uh, Galaxy 7 recall, but is there any way for us, because if the impressions that we're measuring in these kind of numbers include messages that are insufficient to protect the consumer by our own, um, w w which is clear from what we negotiated, those, as I understand it, are still getting counted as the impressions. So I guess I'm just wondering is, is whether there's any effort to try to uh, develop a metric for the content of the message that's, that is getting these impressions as opposed to just the message, which frequently is insufficient from my observations. Mitch, I understand your point, and we can always do better in our discussions with companies to make sure what they plan to put out is pre-cleared through the agency. We try to do that on a regular basis, and, and sometimes um, there's additional messaging that we see that uh, to your point, may not be entirely consistent with what the accepted language was in the release. Let me share one development that we will see as an agency in the coming weeks that we will build upon in 17. And that is the work for responsive design of our website uh, in a more easily understood way to make our website more accessible on mobile platforms. Um, I think we will see some very impressive growth of people coming to our site, seeing our information in a mobile platform. And there's value to that because then you get the whole story when you see it on our site. So something to kind of look forward to as we build that out and sell that to consumers going forward. I'm glad to hear that. And, I, and any thought that, thoughts that you have going forward in terms of a metric of how we can measure the content would be much appreciated. Um, that's all I have by way of questions. Uh, I have. Uh, I, well, I can't take that back. I've got one more. In the past, um, and this is not for you, Mr. Wolfson, I'm sure you're glad to hear, um, but in past, um, 
op plans, there have been there sections, each of them has had a section uh, in the different parts of the agency for unfunded work. Um, and there are priority projects that are listed that did not make it into the op plan for that particular year and often we will revisit those when we come to the mid-year um, adjustments. This year we have no unfunded work listed. So I'm just wondering if this means that all the proposed work from staff is funded in the op plan or, or the op plan or the deferred um, portion or are there any specific product projects including contract dollars and FTEs that are not included that we should know about that we may be seeing in the mid-year? So we did not collect and vet unfunded this year as part of the operating plan process because we were already at 130.5, which is a you know pretty good increase for us. I would point to two known reasonably vetted set of unfundeds, however. The first would be, I would refer you to the FY 2017 OMB budget request. We had requested additional funds for chronic hazards and additional funds for import surveillance. Uh, and additional funds for maintaining current levels for various things. And none of those were included in the congressional request, and those are still vetted known requirements above the 130.5. The second one would be ATVs. We spent a fair amount of time in the spring developing a multi-year project plan for ATVs. We funded part of that at the mid-year in 2016, but there's still a fair piece of that that's unfunded. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, so I, I, that concludes my questions, unless I have any follow-ups after um, Commissioner uh, Mohorovic and Commissioner Burkle. But I would just say, again, thank you so much, and I look forward to our continuing discussions over the next few weeks and figure out what we do and don't do. Thank you. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Um, I do just want to comment on what Commissioner uh, Robinson just mentioned with regards to uh, companies getting their messages out. So having been in the public life, I would have put out a press release or I put out a statement and then a local newspaper or an AP press or who, whomever would take that and they will interpret my words. And so it's not oftentimes the company's fault. It is what happens to it once it's dispersed out there in Neverland. So I don't think it is as intentional as it maybe sounds. Um, I have a, this, the tip over issue is of grave concern to me. Um, I, first of all, want to laud my fellow commissioners for the initiatives they've taken, for the hard work they've put in with regards to uh, the INE campaign and the Anchor campaign. And as you mentioned, it's award winning. Um, so I do want to make sure um, I express that appreciation. I'm a big proponent of INE campaigns. I think that. Uh, used properly and put in the right form and, and when they rise to this level where the quality is good and the, uh, all of the markets that it's put in and it's, it's that title uh, really is so indicative of what the campaign is, uh, that can be very effective. Um, I, in this to Commissioner Robinson, I agree uh, with her on this and I disagree with my colleague, Mr. Uh, Mr. Morovic. I think the uh, the agency uh, has gone way, and I'll say overboard, in mitigating this issue with regards to the compliance actions and with regards to um, the standards committee. Um, and I was very disappointed, as I expressed it to the chairman, to see the ANPR in the, in the ops plan before we got what we requested at mid-year, which was an evaluation as to whether or not the 14 standard is adequate. It seemed to me before we go to rulemaking and we, we make a determination that it's inadequate and we need to strengthen the standard, which is what happened right out of the gate before we've ever measured the data as to whether or not the 14 standard is adequate. There's been a push to, to change that standard. I think, I really do believe we should have waited for that package to come to the commissioners and see what staff says. And so I do want to spend a little bit of time as to that package and I know it would be difficult to forecast to us what's in, you know, in this uh, arena, what's in that package. But I'd like to just express my uh, expectations for that package. Um, I think with regards to IDIs um, and 
maybe you can answer this question now or you want to go back and, and see what's in the briefing package. I would like to see all of the IDIs and which where the incidents, where the injuries and the death occurred, were those pieces compliant with the 2014 standard? Do we know that information? Do we know that those dressers even complied with the 2009 standard? Before we're talking about advancing yet another standard, a stricter standard, I think it's incumbent upon an agency that prides itself in being data-driven that we establish that. What, where are the incidents? And are those dressers compliant or not compliant? And are those dressers ones that were manufactured after 2014, after the standard was enacted where there would, might be an expectation, certainly not an obligation because it is a voluntary standard, an expectation that they would have complied with the 14 standard. But if they're dresses that were manufactured prior to this, that 14 standard, do we have that information? That is all relevant to whether or not the 14 standard is adequate. And until and unless we get that information, I, I do think it's irresponsible and it's very aggressive to have an ANPR in our, in our ops plan. And I, I've expressed that to the chairman and uh, really wished that this could have stayed out. But uh, unfortunately, it's reminiscent of window coverings. You know, we, and, and with regards to the INE campaigns, both of those issues are analogous. I would like to see, and I, I've met with incredible resistance, an INE campaign for window coverings. If we're saying it is a hidden, latent hazard, then it's incumbent upon us in that $1.6 million to make sure we allocate funds for that campaign as well as for the tip over campaign. It, I think we have to be consistent. We have to, to if, if it is a hazard, we have to look at all of the arenas to make sure we're, we're doing what we can do to partner with. And hopefully, you know, with the, uh, with the industry, we'll, they'll reach an adequate voluntary standard for window coverings. We're hopeful that that will happen. But I do believe we should be partnering with them in an INE campaign. And I, I've been really, I'll, I'll say stunned, uh, as to the opposition with regards to an INE campaign when it comes to window coverings. And I, I think it's analogous with the latent hazard of tip overs. But I'm very, I want to go back to where I started, and that is the, the data with regards to whether or not that 14 standard is adequate. And I also um, want to know uh, with regards to, because the uh, chairman did bring it up, uh, the, the kids study, I want to know if, um, if an analysis was, analysis was performed, if we're saying, since we don't have our briefing package and we don't know whether or not the standard's adequate, so there's some reliance on the Nancy, on the Nancy Coles, on the kids' um, study that was done. Have we done an analysis on that, on that study, to determine that the testing conducted by them uh, correlates to the incidents that are occurring in the marketplace? I think that that... Um, I'm not aware of us doing an independent study. We've, we've, we're aware of the report. Um, we've reviewed it, I would say, a, a cursory review, but not a, not a detailed technical critique of the, of the report or the testing. And so if we're going to rely on that report or at least use it as supporting evidence why we need to move to a mandatory standard, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the data in that, in, in that uh, study is something that we can agree with and we, we we need to check it out, and I think that is something we should be talking about uh, to make sure our data is valid before we push forward with an, inc you know, a, a stricter, more stringent standard, or worse yet, to mandatory rulemaking. Um, I, I don't know, independent of what our package is going to indicate to the to the commissioners, ha what other analysis has been done to put the ANPR into the ops plan? Is there anything else or is it what's going to be in that package? What has led us to the point where we put an ANPR in the package without seemingly, as far as I know, have uh, the information we need to support that ANPR? In evaluating whether to, really in evaluating to, from staff what activities we're going to do on TIP over this year, uh, we felt that we needed to put forward a number of different risk management approaches to furniture tip over I and E campaign, which we've heard a lot about the vol continued voluntary standard effort, 
consistent with how we've approached other hazards, we're looking at a parallel track, continuing with voluntary standard, but an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And in looking at the risk management approach of an ANPR, we purposely looked at an ANPR because it is just that and that it's the notification to the public should the commission, you know, vote to publish the Federal Register notice that we are considering rulemaking. You know, it's early in the process. It allows us to receive public comment on proposed approaches. It's early in the process, so we don't yet necessarily have proposed performance requirements that it would be specifically, but it's an opportunity to put out to the public that we are looking at that as a risk management option being a mandatory regulation and opening up public comment on that approach. So if we're talking about mitigating a latent hazard, um, has the staff definitively determined that the 14 standard is inadequate? That's still completing that analysis and we're not done with that yet, no. So, so we don't have that information yet? Correct. Okay. Um, th that's all I have for now, but I will have another round. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to start by having the record removed of all the nice things I said about my colleagues today. <laughs> I wasn't planning on talking more about uh, furniture tip over and anchor it, but I feel compelled to do so and to defend myself and my position. There are millions of products, on, products in the marketplace today that no effort in the voluntary standards arena, no efforts in the mandatory standards arena will, will be able to impact. Furthermore, we know for a fact that there are non-defective chest of drawers where people are putting televisions on top of them, doing something that we wish they would not, but they are doing it. They're going to continue to do it. And our only way to get the message across to consumers to not put televisions on, on chest of drawers and other furniture that it's not designed to hold is to go ahead and tell them through the Anchor It campaign and to furthermore to anchor that product. So I believe it's dishonest to say that we have mitigation strategies to affect that product, to mitigate that hazard through other means, through our voluntary, through our standards process. We don't. If we don't continue to fund Anchor It, I have not heard of another mitigation strategy for that scenario, for product that none of us, that nobody in the Office of Compliance would consider a defective product. A hazardous scenario? Scenario? Certainly. A lethal scenario, certainly, but the only way to mitigate that is to do it through information and education, and we have an award-winning campaign. So I'm disappointed that my, I don't know what other mitigation strategy my fellow commissioners have in mind to address this hazard, other than we're going to choose not to address this hazard, because we do have too many hazards that we'd like to address, but funding doesn't allow for it. Because I do think it's intellectually dishonest to say that we can address that through standards, through mandatory rulemaking. Would you yield? If you if you get to that particular seconds. point, Commissioner, All I, Morgan, say I didn't say anything nice too, but I'd like to re remove from the record nice things I've said about you in the past. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You didn't say anything nice about me. Um, I just want to say I was in North Carolina last week in Hickory, and I spoke to the furniture industry, and I would. Uh, they would beg to differ at what you're saying, uh, and I cannot speak to the compliance actions that are going on in this agency, but um, that is addressing the dressers that are in the marketplace aggressively, and I, I don't agree with the strategy, but it's there. Commissioner Burkle, the strategy to address misuse of dressers and putting CRT TVs on top of chest of drawers is being addressed today outside of Anchorage. Is that what you're suggesting? I would say that our compliance action here, not with the CRTVs, but with dressers, your original point was whether or not the dressers complied. You said there's a, all of the incidents, dressers not complying with the standard, and that issue is being addressed, much to my chagrin. Mr. Wolfson, what percentage of fatalities associated with furniture tip-over involves a CRT on top? 
This is from our standard literature. Quickly, please. It's a number. I, I don't have the breakout just the CRT, but I, I do no, know that near, nearly half involve both the furniture and the TV coming down together related to the fatality. So both of those hazards need to be addressed. Agreed. And that's what I agree with, too. And that's why I think the Anchorage campaign is so important, because also the Anchorage campaign <laughs> covers those other products that are subject to the voluntary standard or potentially a future mandatory standard. If we can get that message across, uh, because if we all just think that a future standard is going to mitigate this hazard to a level that we're comfortable with, I think we're kidding ourselves. Even if we have an effective standard, consumers will use these products in foreseeable ways that any reasonable standard wouldn't be able to address. Unless we come to the conclusion that a chest of drawers needs to be a TV stand. And there's a standard for that. I personally don't think my chest of drawers should be a TV stand because we know people are going to put a TV stand on top of a chest of drawers. That's my personal opinion. So uh, I've used the first half of my time <laughs> talking, but it was fun to get in a debate with my Republican colleague, Commissioner Burkle, on the subject. I think we see more alike on this subject than is let on here. Um, in terms of, of letting on as well, the chairman mentioned that he suggested to put rulemaking in the operating plan, an ANPR. Uh, Mr. Borlase, you mentioned that staff considered uh, putting an ANPR in, in, in furniture. So uh, is, is this a chicken and the egg scenario? I mean, who, who instructed whom? Did this bubble up from the staff, or as the chairman say, did he instruct staff to put ANPR in a mandatory standard? It certainly came up from the chairman, and but in terms of evaluating you know, the chairman's request, that is the thought process that staff went through and looking at the rulemaking, it's... Smart move. I used to have a CEO, too, and when he made a recommendation, I, uh, you know, I, pretty, I gave it a pretty good thought as well. Uh, where, I, where I strongly agree with Commissioner Burkle here is, and Chairman, with all due respect, to put in our operating plan an ANPR suggests we don't even have the report. This commission funded an essential piece of data to, in, to inform the Commission whether or not the 2057-14 standard is effective. And we don't even have the results of that. How can we suggest and dedicate resources that could otherwise be spent el elsewhere into an ANPR without having the results of that work? Now, I know for a fact you don't have all these, pr all these reports, and I'm not suggesting that you hold them and, you know, and just keep your own, keep, you, you get informed, these come up when it comes up with the rest of the commission. But it suggests that almost, that why do we need this other report? Some people are saying that systems are rigged in Washington, D.C. It seems a little bit like this thing's rigged if we're suggesting that, hey, the outcome of that report better be ANPR and go into mandatory rulemaking. Um, I was a strong supporter uh, behind, I think it was a co-amendment, but Commissioner Robinson took the lead. I'm, I'm happy to take as much credit for that, for that forthcoming project in terms of determining the effectiveness of 2057 as, as is justified, uh, but because I think that's a critical piece of information to inform what we do next with future production. And I don't think now is a place to discuss or to debate whether or not an ANPR is appropriate at this point in time in the op plan. But I do think it's appropriate to talk about whether or not anchoring it should be funded in the, in the operating plan. I think before, and I'm willing to move off of op plan, but I think the chairman would like, would you, chairman, would you like me to yield to, and no, okay, I thought you were looking to, wanting to respond on, on um, further on furniture tip over or anchor it. Um, I, will, I will move off of anchor it at this point in time, but I felt obliged to, to uh, defend my position on why I think it should be a funding priority. Moving on to crib bumpers, if we can. The staff just recently completed a, uh, a, a package with four identified regulatory options to address the risks of deaths and injury associated with crib bumpers. And um, in looking at the mandatory standards table, staff does not suggest or recommend preparation of either an ANPR or an NPR, uh, but instead suggests uh, data analysis and or technical review. Uh, what is uh, foreseen in terms of the staff's recommendation as opposed to um, I would otherwise 
lead to be led to believe that staff uh, suggested rulemaking if there was a, if it said a n p r n p r as opposed to d a t r but there was a thorough amount of work that was done what what more in terms of d a data analysis and or technical review still needs to be done and is recommended by staff so in seventeen on crib bumper staff um, has Main activity is related to the voluntary standards related to crib bumpers. There is also some data analysis work in there. The last direction from the Commission on Rulemaking was to initiate rulemaking as a result of approval of the petition and as laid out in the Record of Commission Action. So we have um, laid out in the package four different rulemaking uh, options, all of which from 104th really through. Um, do require work as we laid out in the package. And so the 17 work relates to um, voluntary standard work, also looking further at performance requirements. I think it was clear from the package that there was still some work that could be done on defining performance requirements. There's a lot of unknown still, and that's the other area that staff's looking at for crib bumpers. You mentioned that staff was under direction uh, for rulemaking. Uh, in that case, why, why wasn't there a recommendation for ANPR, NPR in the mandatory standards table? We, uh, when we looked at what we needed to do for 17, we just, we felt that uh, for the resources we were putting for it, that um, doing both more, I guess, additional data analysis, that research piece on the mandatory side and the voluntary side, was the appropriate way to go in 17. Okay. Uh, I'll just close it up if you can. I know I'm out of time. But I if we were suggesting to, to not go forward with mandatory rulemaking, uh, I just wonder why it wasn't a similar approach as is suggested with upholstered furniture to send a briefing package to recommend terminating any uh, rulemaking procedure moving forward to then unclutter further the regulatory agenda. Sorry for going over, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Borlase, do you want to address that? I'm happy to use my time for that, Mr. Stevenson. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I, <laughs> no, I was trying no, to no, I, I, no, I just some of it, I wasn't sure was I, common or question. If staff was not recommending moving forward with rulemaking, as they have recommended not moving forward or terminating rulemaking on upholstered furniture, I'm just curious as to why they didn't follow a similar approach with crib bumpers as they did with upholstered furniture and to not increase what's otherwise a cluttered regulatory agenda where we're not really um, promulgating. That's all. From the analysis and as we laid out, while there were, we recognized on crib bumpers that there are going to be difficulties with going forward with rulemaking, staff didn't get to a point where they felt that the recommendation should be to terminate rulemaking. Thanks, Dr. Borlase. Uh, I would hope that uh, we can run this last round, and this will be our final round for the sake of uh, humaneness for the staff who sit in front of us. I'm sure that they would concur with that. And behind us, Commissioner Adler is correct. So I'm going to not use up all my time as well. I do want to uh, thank Dr. Borlase for those answers on the crib bumper package. I've had strong feelings about this product for many years, even when I worked for the prior chairman. And I do plan to offer an operating plan amendment that I will, just, of course, circulate amongst the commissioners after discussing with staff about finding a path forward. And even in the staff package that was sent up, certainly combined with the package that was sent up in 2013, I do believe that there is an ongoing hazard that is also addressable. But I'll get into that later as the op plan discussions continue. Uh, I do want to just mention briefly about Anchor It that I don't think the issue is an abstract one or a, a conclusive one about the value of that program. I th just think it's all relative. And you hinted at this, Commissioner Mohorovic. It's about making very difficult choices. Uh, I'm certainly open to any amendment that you may put forth to find this money, but no surprise with the discussions that I've had with Mr. Wolfson that at some point we have to know what we're getting for this money. And while we may have uh, a belief about its effectiveness for any education program. I don't know that we've done the difficult work that I think we need to do to know that this money, considering how precious it is for us for any I E campaigns, is actually making a difference. So that's my hesitation with it. It has nothing to do with its, its uh, abstract value. I think it's an excellent campaign. In an ideal world, we would get $5 million above our base. I'm sure Mr. Wilson would be very happy with that. 
to fund this and to fund it robustly and to put into it an evaluative component that would actually give us some type of conclusive responses. So I have nothing more on that. Thank you again to the staff both for sitting here and enduring this. I know that these are never easy. I think you did a phenomenal job and we look forward to working with you on the questions that we have and the amendments that we're forming. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will try to uh, be brief. And I uh, have been reminded that we got a little carried away with the regulatory agenda, and I've been implored not to repeat the, the length of that meeting. But um, listening to Commissioner Mohorovic and uh, my colleagues on tip over, uh, I don't, I don't want to use a trite expression that you're both right because there are certain things that are contradicting one another, but I think it's fair to say they're both valid points. To say that we're doing effective recalls, uh, even if you don't approve of them, recalls is a terrific mitigation strategy for stuff that's in the marketplace. But the point, uh, Commissioner Mohorovic, that I think you're making that is extraordinarily uh, on target is uh, that that's part of a multifaceted approach and we could have an effective recall program that still leaves millions and millions of uh, people at risk and so the two are not inconsistent uh, and it may and what you're doing is making a point which I confess I'm very sympathetic to that uh, this might be an area if we can possibly find some additional resources to use to address tip overs because it is such an extraordinary problem I also uh, I don't want to get too lost into whether we do an ANPR or we don't, but I do want to go at least to a more generic observation. Uh, one of the things that I heard that makes me uncomfortable is this notion that, well, we don't know what the injury pattern is. And I just want to reiterate that when the people who wrote the Consumer Product Safety Act wrote it, they went out of their way to send a strong message that we don't have to wait for a body count. Uh, and I, I hope we never get into the posture that we uh, are immobile until we've seen bodies accumulate. There are tremendous engineers within this agency who can look at products, test them, and say this product is a hazard, and especially when we've got an equally excellent human factor staff that can help um, paint that picture. And it, it would be my hope that we never have to wait for bodies to accumulate, that we find out early on that there's a hazard and we act decisively. So uh, end of comments. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Just very quickly. Um, I, I want to be perfectly clear that uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, the campaign that's been put together for Anchor, it's been outstanding. Um, I just, uh, and, and certainly I think this is a multi-front um, effort to try to stop kids from dying and being seriously injured from furniture tipping over. Um, but you certainly the beginning and end of what we need to do is not an I and E campaign as Commissioner Burkle seems to be implying. Um, we first have to design out the hazard. So I don't mean anything that I'm saying in terms of the other efforts that we should be making to in any way um, imply that the anchor campaign is not important. But as we all know, it's going to reach a limited number of people, number one. Number two, there are so many people with little kids that cannot anchor their furniture to the wall without paying a penalty that they can't afford, whether it's veterans housing, whether it's whether it's public housing, whether it's rental units. There are, we just know that there are limitations. Even if we got the message to everyone in the country, there, there are limits to what we can do with the Anchor It campaign. Um, to, to describe us as having been overboard, going overboard on this, I think is, uh, is extremely, um, uh, very, very, very inaccurate. There's still so much dangerous product out there. Dangerous product out there. I think all of us have been impressed in a very negative way at how much furniture both the kids report and we are finding that doesn't even meet the most minimal standard. And and, and, and anybody will tell you that whether the voluntary standard that's in place does or does not. Um, is or is is not adequate. Um, I, nobody's going to say it's anything other than the most minimal standard. And there's so much dangerous product out there that doesn't even meet that. But then as Commissioner Mo Mohorovic pointed out, the deaths are happening with things that meet this standard. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to stand and watch. I mean, I was down in North Carolina at the ASTM meeting and they brought out product that had been selected for the committee and for the CPSC to see. And they showed us what, what furniture met the the standard and it was uh, it, it, there was just no way that a real life situation with a two year old scampering around was going to in any way um, be sufficient to 
to design out this standard. So I look forward to working on this, um, design out this hazard. I look forward to working on multiple fronts on this, and I certainly think the Anchor It campaign has been and is very effective, but there are so many other fronts on, on which we should be working. That, nothing further. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. I just want to emphasize my point, and that is that if we are pushing for an ANPR or we are pushing for a, a more stringent voluntary standard, it's incumbent upon us to have the data that justifies that. And until and unless I see this briefing package with the IDIs, with the information, the injury and death information, and whether or not those uh, dressers complied with the standard, I, I can't I can't make that judgment call. And so I just believe we are data driven and that should be our emphasis. I just want to talk briefly about um, upholstered furniture and the package we started the discussion and I appreciated the opportunity yesterday um, with regards to now what. And um, so we are going to get a briefing package, well we did get a briefing package on TB117 and um, whether or not to adopt it as a standard. And also with um, a recommendation from the staff that we terminate the flammability sta rulemaking standard. Um, and I appreciate all the work that went into that and um, found it very useful. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but I want to hear um, from you today. How will the termination of the rulemaking um, on the flammability affect the resources that are allocated with regards to this hazard? So for 17, I, and I appreciate the question because it does highlight a point that staff wanted to make sure was clear in the TB117 package. While staff is recommending terminating the mandatory rulemaking, that's not the same as staff not wanting to work to address the hazard anymore. Staff recognizes that when it comes to residential fires and especially deadly uh, residential fires, that upholstered furniture, the fuel load in furniture is a contributor to these large fires and we want to address that risk. What staff saying is we want to take a couple other approaches that don't include mandatory rulemaking, the other risk management approaches. So in the 17 operating plan, we've put the resources towards voluntary standards work, put the resources towards uh, research and then, you know, other other work with what's available perhaps with Scott Wolfson and OCM. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the, the briefing package that we're expecting with regards to terminating the rulemaking? Will that include all of the testing that's been done, uh, all of the chairs and all of the research that's been done out at the lab? Um, from time to time we've seen the contracts coming across um, and being posted, but the in-depth information that was gleaned from all of those studies and all of those tests that were done. Will that be included in the briefing package? Um, yes, in that, um, and I, I guess I'll turn to GC to talk about what are the requirements for terminating the package and what it comes down to is from EXHR, we provide all the technical information to support those requirements. So. Without um, going into a legal analysis that I would provide to you um, in closed session, the process requirements that are referred to earlier in terms of um, ROVs would be the same. The staff would present to the commission a briefing package recommending termination and the reasons why they recommend termination with that recommendation for the commission to then make the ultimate decision. Thank you. My, I think my question's more technical in, in that will those, the all of the testing that's been done to lead us to the point where staff is recommending we terminate that rulemaking, will that be included in the briefing package? Yes, if it's not already published and referred to in another place, we would include that as part of the body of justifying our recommendation. Okay. And um, will the briefing package present us with supporting data as to why TB117 wasn't adequate to address the smolder standard? I'm not, uh, for the FY17 planned work, staff's not planning on doing any additional analysis of TB117 beyond what we presented in the briefing package last week. Okay. Um, one of the reasons um, for terminating the rulemaking is that staff can't make a connection between the small bench scale test results and compare that to the um, flammability performance. Um, 
so if that's a problem and it's been an ongoing problem and the reason why they're advising us to terminate the rulemaking, how then do we, when staff is, is uh, in the voluntary standards process, isn't that a problem that will translate to the voluntary standards committees? I mean, that same being able to, to uh, find the connection between the small bench test, how do you address that? It is, and it's a recognized problem, and staff's been working for years on providing uh, recommendations to the voluntary standards. I know um, from my time in engineering sciences, I think back in 2011, we sent a letter to ASTM with recommendations on how to improve their voluntary standards. So staff's recognized it as a problem, and you know, we've worked with the voluntary standards before, and we plan to keep working with them on, on addressing it. One of my concerns, and I think I alluded to this yesterday, but I'll say it publicly because we're now in, a, in the process of determining which way to go on flammability issue. And so we are going to get this briefing package from staff that recommends we terminate rulemaking on flammability. It seems to me it would make sense that we would pause and give us time to absorb and to read and review that information and then say, to staff policy-wise, this is where we think we should go. If we don't do that, how will staff determine which direction to go in? My understanding is NFPA deals with large open flames. It seems like we've already made the determination that that's not the way to go. So I'm, I'm, under, I'm trying to understand how will staff be directed to, uh, in this endeavor and how, how will they focus their efforts? So we've, uh, in the 17 op plan, our recommended efforts in 17 are aligned with the way we've, pr we've put forward in the op plan. So we would have to, then it would be incumbent upon the commission if we wanted to change directions or we could do that before we vote on the ops plan? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, we talked a little bit yesterday about NFPA, and I, I think you're going to get us the information about the standards committees and what the makeup of the committees are and whether who's at the table and how they, they reach decisions. So we'd appreciate that. Correct. We're working on that. We okay. just weren't able to get it turned around before this morning. Uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Commissioner Marovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just to stay with upholstered furniture for a moment. Um, I know you have in front of me because I dri distributed it to you uh, as a reminder, the V-Star report from the mid-year FY16 to get into um, a, a, gr a level of granularity in terms of what we're going to fund staff uh, to, to resource towards a, a voluntary standard. Now, NFPA 277, you mentioned the extent to which upholstered furniture um, adds to the fuel load of a fire. So is that voluntary standards work to mitigate or create a voluntary standard so that upholstered furniture can withstand large open flame? Is that a transition from small open flame, which might be from a matches or cigarette lighter where upholstered furniture is the first item ignited, to moving towards a different kind of hazard scenario where there's already a fire started and upholstered furniture is, as you said, contributing to the fuel load? Is that correct? I'll have to get back to you on the, whether it's a small open flame or a large open flame with, with NFPA 277 mm -hmm. in that, just to confirm, because different as we've gone through it over the years, there's been different definitions of what's a small open flame versus a large open flame. So I just want to make sure I can get correct for sure. you NFPA's approach on how they're defining the different flame sizes and the flame types and what it's simulating because well, it's in your been own, changed over the years. Thank you. In, in your own words, you said contributing to the fuel load. Is uh, What is uh, envisioned behind contributing to the fuel load? That wouldn't be first item ignited, right? Because fuel load assumes that there's already a load. Yeah, not, there's already not, a fire. You are correct that it expands it beyond first item ignited. So if it was the something in the trash can that ignited first, Right. You know, and then and then the furniture ignites. And then but it limits egress, and then we can find additional fatalities, property damage associated with, whereas if we mitigated it, we could reduce that, right? Correct. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. Uh, nobody foresees barrier technology uh, at all being uh, a potential effective mitigator for large open flames. Is that correct? I mean, I've, I've heard of uh, 
uh, barrier technology and its limited potential with regards to small open flame. But is there uh, is there any is is there any reasonable uh, minds that think in the fire protection arena that barrier technology could with could help mitigate large open flame? I know we're still looking at that. Um, we've uh, just finished and uh, posted last year's rounds of research. We're Saw still looking at it. Um, I think it's fair to say that we don't think it's at a point where we can point to, you know, there's still a lot of applied research that needs to go on in that area. Um, to your point on barriers, we know there's a difference between a barrier for smoldering versus a barrier for f open flame, kind of independent of the size and trying to resolve those two because one sometimes uh, propagates the growth of the other. So if you have a good smoldering barrier, it may not work well for open flame and vice versa. Thank you very much. Mr. Ray, I have, some, I have two questions in compliance um, to page 26, project number 34. 352 is uh, interesting to me in terms of a uh, suggestion that uh, with our import surveillance activities, we'll be able to start um, focusing on defects. And I know that's come up uh, at the commission level. And uh, so I think there's a shared appreciation and in, in, in understanding of, uh, of what we hope to gain by that. Can you provide some clarity in how we propose to go about that at import? I think uh, many are very familiar as I am with our uh, with our successful efforts with regulated products, but in terms of defect analysis at the port of entry is one that uh, piques my interest. So I'll um, talk very generically without getting into specific um, uh, techniques we'll be using. Um, you know, I think we've um, highlighted the, how the RAM and the targeting system has helped us um, identify potential violations on a, on a regulated side. Um, and we realized that on the defect side, um, it's, it's a challenge. Um, but what I would say is that we are looking at ways that we could do that um, and work with um, the import team, working with the compliance team to help in those situations. Um, and some of that is um, as simple as using the data to understand where things that we've identified as the defects are coming from, sources trying to identify potential sources where products that are defective are coming from and, and trying to target on that basis. But without getting too much more specific, um, we're looking at different ways to try to use the targeting systems to improve it beyond just the regulated side. Well, thank you. I applaud those efforts. I'm encouraged by them and excited about it. And uh, I'll be continuing to work with you in the, uh, the extent to which we're successful moving in that direction. I think that's uh, a wonderful turn. The, the last point uh, that I have for the meeting, too, the, the meeting today is with regards to page 20 on the compliance um, priorities, I did notice a, a prioritization with regards to tracking labels. And uh, tracking labels and, and their effectiveness with regards to, I, I've never seen them pointed to as, uh, as anything that is uh, improving recall effectiveness. I recognize that it's a congressional mandate and therefore we had to promulgate a, a, a statute uh, and uh, my research has found out where that came from, from a set of recommendations that came from Commissioner Moore and Congress took their word for it. What are we doing with tracking labels in terms of a priority for compliance in FY17? Uh, so I won't get into the specifics of the enforcement policy that we're talking about, but how I would characterize this as um, this is really probably more of an internal efficiency um, exercise that the Office of Compliance and Import Safety team has identified as a way to uh, make the current process that we are using to enforce uh, tracking label violations to make it a more efficient process. Well, I would hope in looking at the limited resources you have available to you, uh, considering in a risk-based decision-making uh, consideration the extent to which uh, greater compliance with our tracking label um, regulation will uh, help safety in, in any uh, essence at all. I'm not suggesting um, enforcement guidance or something other than that, but there is a lot of different violations that we can direct attention towards, and I'm just wondering what the yield, to use a term that the chairman used earlier, in get it ramping up compliance with the tracking label, as I've still yet to hear uh, anybody finding from what was expected through CPSIA, the 
uh, mandatory tracking labels for children's products. And in fact, I researched as many of our recalls, and none of them even mentioned the tracking labels. So I don't know how it, uh, it is also, as uh, the statute intends, it's going to help consumers uh, understand better whether or not a recall is associated with a product that they do or don't have. So um, we can follow up on that. Maybe I can get a better understanding on uh, why that's considered a compliance priority for 2017. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the Commission, to the staff, including our special assistants. We are due to vote on October 19th in a public setting. There will be a lot of 